Welcome back to another stream. Hi! <laughs> How is everyone doing? Let me know if you can see me clearly. Let me know if you can hear me. It is Thursday night here in Malaysia. I think it's about 10 o'clock. You can see it's dark outside. It is actually raining now. It's quite heavy. I'm not sure if you can hear the rain noise. Hopefully the, the audio is not too distracting. But hey, the stream has to go on. Now, um, before I start with the stream, well, today's topic is kit lenses. I love kit lenses. Right before we dive into the topic, I do have some announcements to make. And hey, let's say hi to some people first. But first, coffee. Always coffee first. Just want to show off my Canon L lens, white pro lens mug. <laughs> hmm. All right, who we have here? Wow, we already have 40 people live. Zoltan, hey Zoltan, how are you? Thanks for stopping by, nice to see you again. Jen Garcia, hi Jen, how are you? Nice to see you again. Pro R greetings says, oh, Pro R says, greetings from around the world. How are you, Pro R? Thanks for being here. Yumi, hey, very nice to see you, Yumi, and this time you made it early. Yumi says, hi, Robin, hi, everyone. Hi, how are you? Jerome Khan says, hello, hey, Jerome, how are you? Nice to see you here. Ovidio Angel says, hi, Robin, hey, Ovidio. Very nice to see you here, hope you are well. Farah says, kit lenses, let's go, yes, let's do this. <laughs> Sixters Backmaster says, Greetings all from a frigate New York City. <laughs> Is it really that frigate there? Huh. I've never been there, so I wouldn't know. Hey, Charles says, Hi all. Hey, Charles, how are you? Nice to see you here. Bram says, hello, greetings from the Netherlands. Wow, that is very far away. Greetings to you too. Ton ba Van Bruchem says, hi Robin, hey Ton, how are you? Samba Pasta says, hi Robin, hey. I love the 14 to 150 Mark II. I was wondering if Lumix G9 is a good replacement for the EM5 Mark II. I think they're both about the same. I don't think there's much difference, but the G9 is a lot larger. But in terms of video features, the G9 is definitely better, right? And G9 has a new image sensor, has much larger uh, electronic viewfinder. But other than that, I don't think it's a huge upgrade. But I will push for the G9 Mark II if you can afford it. All right, before we go on with, with the stream, before we dive into the hot topic, which kit lenses we love, right? Obviously, I said I love micro four thirds lenses. Uh, I do have some announcements to make first, some important announcements, and I'm very excited to share some of this news with you guys. So the first one is that I am going live with Rob Track. So the secret society for these micro four thirds content creators, the YouTubers, we are going live together. This will be on the 28th of January. That's about one week from now. <laughs> That's the, the next uh, following Sunday, right? So I'm going live with Benjamin Chappell, Brian James. Uh, Brian James is that Micro Four Thirds guy. And of course, the two amazing friends, uh, Mati Sulanto and Peter Forsgaard. And this live stream, join the live stream, will be hosted by Rob Track. I will pull up the link to this live stream. Let me see if I can find the link here. Quickly copy it and paste it here. Uh, you can check your local time on this particular link here. So do go to the YouTube link. It is on Rob Track's YouTube channel. If you can't access it for whatever reasons, just search Rob Track. Go to the live streams and there will be two live streams, part one and part two. I will be live together with the content creators on the part one of the stream. I think we do have a lot of topics to talk about, a lot of thoughts to share. And yeah, I just can't wait to get together with some really awesome people and just hang out. And hopefully guys, you. Hopefully, I'll see you guys there as well. Do come in and say hi. All right. Uh, the second announcement is more local here in Malaysia. Uh, there will be something happening next week. RT Shutter or N4 Camera is uh, one of the largest retailers in Malaysia. They will be organizing a photo festival. It will be happening on the 25th to the 27th of January. So let me just see if I can find this. Yes. 
uh, this photo festival, which is running next week, Thursday to Saturday, will be happening at Geo Space. If you're wondering why it's a Thursday, why it's not on the weekends, it's because Thursday here in Malaysia is a public holiday. It is Thai Pusam. So people do get time off from work. That's why they are doing it on Thursday to Saturday. So on Thursday itself, at Geo Space, I don't know exactly where Geo Space is. It is somewhere in Pataling Jaya. I've never been there myself so i just had to figure it out on thursday uh you, as you can see on on the screenshot a lot of brands will be participating canon will be there nikon will be there fuji will be there om system will be there a recall sony everyone will be there uh, i think it'll be a very fun uh day with full of activities there'll be talks there'll be some uh really interesting things happening as well like fuji is offering free sensor cleaning services uh my friend uh azul let me see if i can click this my friend azul Anan will be having a talk there at three o'clock and I personally will be there at three o'clock as well to support my friend Azul. So if you guys are free on Thursday, you should be free. It is a public holiday. Do drop by at Geospace in Putaling Jaya. Uh, find me in person. Do come and say hi. I promise I won't bite. And I'll be there maybe before three o'clock just to hang around and say hi to people. And I'll attend Azul's talk. And of course, after the talk, I'll hang around a little bit more. But I do have to leave uh, after that because, hey, it's Thursday and I do have these live streams happening on Thursdays. So I have to come home, get a bit of rest and then set up for my li uh, weekly live streams, right? Uh, for this particular event, I will find the link to their Facebook. Do check out Ati Shutter's Facebook. And you can actually go to the Facebook uh, link here and you can find all the information there. <laughs> all right, uh, that's two important uh, announcements that, that are happening. One is I'm going live with uh, Rock Track and other amazing Micro Four Thirds content creators, Brian James, Benjamin Chappell, Mati Solanto, Peter Fosca. And of course, next week there'll be locally here in Malaysia, there'll be a uh, photo festival happening. And I can't wait to be there to meet some of you guys if you guys are going there. And this week, I released a new video on Monday. That's just a few days ago. If you don't, uh, if you didn't see the video, it was about this compact camera from more than ten years ago. This is the Fuji XF1. I don't know if you can go nearer to the camera if you can't focus. This is the Fuji XF1. And uh, unfortunately, uh, there are two things that I don't like about the camera. Actually, the camera is, is beautiful, right? It's so stylish. Uh, it is very compact. It's very small. I think the lens is great. It does produce some really good quality image for a compact camera. But uh, the thing is you have to like twist and turn to the lens to turn on the camera. And then, uh, wait, how come this is not turned on? Something is not right. All right, the camera is turned on. And uh, this particular camera has suffered the issue that everyone is suffering. I don't think you can see this clearly. It has some lens control error problem. <laughs> So yeah, um, that's the risk of me buying things in the used market. I found one. It's in a very good condition, right? There's there's zero scratch on this camera. I think the shutter count is very low. And I thought like, hey, you know, I spent some money to create some content. And obviously, I just want to satisfy my own curiosity to shoot with the camera, to shoot with a Fuji. Fuji is like a beloved brand now, right? With all the retro styling and everything. And hey, just give Fuji a chance. But this unforgivable mistake that they did with that, on on off turning lens rotating mechanism thing which i find so annoying and then there's, there's this camera that just died on me on the second day of use uh, because of the lens control error which is like a common thing it's a manufacturing defect i'm like i'm getting less and less excited with fuji products to be honest <laughs> but don't let that sway your opinion it's just me uh i've used some fuji products before i had the sf10 which i gave away to a friend i had the original x100 and i've used the x100f before i've owned them i bought them with my own money and i sold them off i have tried the xt1 st2 and some of the x pro cameras i am just not a fan all right let's uh go on to the comments before we dive into the topic micro four thirds Awesome, awesome 
Kit Lenses. <laughs> Zotan says, Hi Robin, I love your hat. Thank you so much. It is awesome, right? It's micro four thirds. Hesha Manro, hey, how are you? Very nice to see you. Hesha Manro says, Hello from the cold but bright and dry Isle of Wight, UK. Cheers to that, Hesha Manro. Very nice to see you. Hmm. Gonna say hi to some people. Ton says, can hear you and see you good. Thank you so much. If you guys haven't realized, if you guys haven't seen something different, if you guys check this video, uh, it is actually streaming in 4K. <laughs> For the first time, I'm streaming in 4K. And uh, I got this new capture card. I tried it uh, two weeks ago. It didn't work very well, but... Yeah, I'm giving it another go, and so far, no problem. And we have a super chat from Chua. Thank you so much, Chua, for the super chat. That's very generous of you. Thank you so much. And yeah, like, like I said, I, I continuously try to improve myself. I continuously trying to find things to, 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 to push uh, to get better, right? Whether it's this live stream or, uh, or my video production, making content for you guys here. And all these things cost money. And the capture card that I bought, it costs like around 50 US dollars. And I thought, hey, it's New Year's. Why don't we have a new resolution, right? And my new resolution is 4K. <laughs> I know, I know it's so lame. But yeah, uh, I thought it was it's pretty cool. I'm, I'm now streaming in 4K and not many people are doing that. Uh, do let me know how this 4K stream look on the screen. And... I know a lot of people say you don't have to do streaming 4K because it's going to be very taxing on your computer's graphic cards. You need a powerful machine to run 4K live streaming. And then you also have to, uh, to have a powerful internet connection, a really fast connection to support the, the bandwidth and everything. It's just making things difficult. But I do intend to share photographs. And I think that the photographs will look so much better on a 4K live stream compared to a full HD. And I am talking about photography. This channel is about photography. I want to share my passion about cameras and, and image taking, right? If, if I were to share my images, I, I want them to look as good as possible. So in line with that, I thought that a 4K live stream would improve at least the viewing experience of the photographs that I'm about to share a little bit better, right? So yeah, so your contribution, especially from Super Chats, uh, Buy Me Coffee, or any, directly from PayPal from you guys, especially from Chua, this Super Chat will help me uh, because obviously I'm buying all these equipments with, with my own money. So thank you so much for the contribution. You are helping me to become better. Geoff Heron says, England, hello, North East. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Geoff. Thanks. Thanks for being here. Very nice to see you. Prat says, very good. Glad to join you live from the rainy Netherlands. Thank you so much, Pro Art. And yeah, very nice to see you here. Sorry, I can't pronounce your name. Says, Hi, Robin. Hello to you too. Thanks for being here. Jari Huikari. Hey, how are you? Very, very nice to see you here. Hi. It's snowing here in Finland. Yeah, I bet it is is i bet it is so cold as well ton says from the netherlands hey ton steve says hi from germany hey steve thanks for dropping by very nice to see you kicks of texas says hello robin and everyone from san antonio hey kicks very nice to see you here thanks for dropping by miss spelly t1 says hi robin marty from maryland US. Hi, Marty. How are you? Very nice to see you. Thanks for being here. I appreciate that. Ken Hong. Hey, nice to see you again, Ken. Ken says, hi, Mr. Wong. Still have my 12 to 50 EM5 kit lens. Still liking it. 12 to 50, you see? Yeah, I have it here as well. Oh, it's a little bit... Uh, let me just make sure it looks good. Yeah, that's uh, 12 to 50 here. I have it as well. It came with the original EM5 that I bought and I still have the lens. I think it is a fantastic lens. I think it is wonderful. I sometimes still use it, 1250. Amazing, amazing lens. <laughs> Terry Day. Hey, Terry. Very nice to see you. How are you? Terry says, hi, Robin from the UK. Sunny and cold. Well, at least it's sunny. Right? You get some good light. You can go out and get some nice photographs. 
Sixters, but Messer says uh, Rob Trett has been posting some superb self portraits taken with an Olympus 14 to 42 kit lens. I know, right? Rob Trett has some really, really cool self portraits. It's so cool that I, if, if he was nearby, I'll just ask him to take portraits of me. Why would I want to bother taking self portraits <laughs> when you have someone like Rob Trett, right? But, but too far, he's living too far away. And speaking of 14 to 42, look what I have here. 14 to 42, Olympus Pancake F4, no, F3.5 to 5.6, the EZ Zoom. There you go. I still love this lens. I think this is one of the best kit lenses out there ever. Yumi says, I sold the 12 to 50 kit lens as new to recoup some costs for buying the original EM5. Of course, if you have other lenses that you use, if you are a specialized, uh, if you're doing something more specialized like macro or birding, or if you are doing wide angle photography, or if you're doing portraits, you have some prime lenses, then it doesn't make sense to keep the kit lens, right? Just sell it off to recoup some costs. I agree with you. Ken says, Robin, the XF1 lens reminds me a bit of Lumix 12 to 32, where you have to unlock the lens to activate. It's different. Uh, the 14 to 42, I have it here. Now, the difference is that the unlocking mechanism is just to make the lens small, right? To make it, it's an affordable mechanism. So it just, you can turn it and make it like longer and so that once you you're not using it you just make it smaller so it's easier to keep it and it's smaller in size that's it and you can't use the camera until you unlock the lens right that's that's true as well however you can turn on the camera and use other lenses with or without this lens right so this is just the lens itself but the fuji sf1 is a fixed lens compact it's a compact camera you can't change lens so once the lens runs into problem it has flex cable issue or I don't know, the cable has some connection problem or there are some other issues that I'm not aware of. There's lens error. Once there's a lens error, the entire camera is bricked. It is useless. So I don't think it's the same issue. Uh, whereas the reason why this lens extends, the same with the Olympus 14-42 and this uh, Panasonic lens, is just to make the lens really small and, and a pancake in size so that it's easy to store away. Next, Richard says, greetings from Pennsylvania, US. I'm interested in trying Micro Four Thirds with an EM1, EM5 Mark I and wondering what a good first lens would be. I believe there is some issue with the image stabilization. What issue? I have the EM5 Mark I. This is, well, I have everything with me today. This is the EM5 Mark I, the original. Uh, I don't understand what image stabilization problem. I have a lot of friends with EM5 original and all the image stabilization still works today. No problem whatsoever, right? Uh, which first lens would be good? I would suggest, depends on your budget, if you can go for it, uh, any of the kit lenses like this uh, Lumix 12 to 32, you can go with this, or if you want a weather sealing, weather sealed lens to pair with the EM5, because EM5 that is weather sealed against splash and dust, then you can consider this uh, 12 to 50 uh, f 3.5 to 6.3. This lens is also weather sealed, and it has a very nice macro mode as well. I don't know if you can focus and see this macro switch here right so i thought this lens is quite a good lens to start it offers a very versatile zoom range it starts from wide angle 12 millimeters and goes all the way to uh 50 that's 24 to 100 that's very generous it's weather sealed it has a macro function i thought this lens is pretty good to start with or if you want like really good image quality then you can of course consider like 12 to 40 f 2.8 pro there are so many choices that you can choose from i don't think there are bad choices right it depends on how much money you're willing to spend if you want to purely just go for budget then uh, you can start with this lumix 12 to 32 super tiny super compact you get super sharp results and if you want something more powerful uh, then of course the 12 to 40 f 2.8 pro right as Comis says, you look sharp in 4K. Great upgrade. Thank you so much. Yeah, I have to like rewatch my stream to see how I look, right? Of course, I've done a test before this, just a private stream uh, so that I can rewatch and make sure everything goes well. Uh, yeah, it looks okay, but this is the first time I'm going live on 4K. So I'm a little bit nervous. Anything can go wrong. Uh, the capture card can just overheat or my 
computer can decide to just malfunction or the OBS streaming software can just decide to give me an error. I don't know. There's like a thousand possibilities of things going wrong, right? So I'm very nervous. Uh, if things do go wrong, please bear with me. I will try my best to troubleshoot and yeah, and continue this stream as, as best as, as I can. <laughs> Rebirth2526 says, I heard that once 20 f1.7 and 14 f2.5 used to be bundled as kit lenses as well. I Okay, let's just... Um, let's define what kit lens is. I understand when you say kit is a bundled lens, and that also means that if you buy like a, a flagship camera, you're bundled with a 24 to 70 f2.8. Uh, pro lens and that is a an expensive bundled kit lens right but for the sake of today's discussion let's just keep it narrower so that we don't have like 20 different lenses to talk about or a variety of so many different lenses so when i talk about kit lens i'm referring to budget something that is affordable and really cheap and usually it comes with entry-level DSLR or mirrorless cameras. Traditionally, Canon has for the DSLRs the 18 to 55, S3.5 to 5.6. Same with Nikon 18 to 55. There's some variants there and here, the 16 to 70 or something. Uh, same with Sony, I think there's like 18 to 55 kit lens. And for Olympus, it has always been like 14 to 42. Panasonic has some 14 to 45, 14 to 42. And then more recently, we have like a uh, uh, Panasonic 12 to 32, and these are the lenses that are paired with the lower level affordable cameras, right? That's why we call them kit lenses. And why I want to celebrate them is because they're so cheap, they come with the camera, basically, they cost almost nothing. If you buy them used in the market, uh, they cost even lower, and yet they produce excellent results and in this stream i want to share some of the photographs that I actually taken with these lenses and i thought that they perform really well if you're not doing any serious photography and if you are a professional photographer of course i wouldn't encourage you to use kit lenses uh, not that you can't use it but there are better options for different case use scenarios but i want to show that these kit lenses are fully capable in a lot of situations and especially if you're just doing casual street photography or everyday uh, snapshots right you want to do some photo projects personal projects or if you're doing travel photography you just want to travel with minimal footprint something as small as say the gm1 this is the gm1 camera look at how tiny it is something as tiny as the gm1 it's not in focus because my face is in focus and uh the 14 12 to 32 uh kit lens still can't get it to focus <laughs> all right uh and when you have this com combination, look at how tiny it is. So I just brought this for some of my travels and I thought that this is more than sufficient to get almost everything done, really. Right, so yeah, that's, uh, that's, I wanna de define uh, the scope of the kit lens so that we don't get too wild. And some people will say, hey, how about the Olympus 12 to 100? How about the, the Nikon 28 to, to 250? I mean, oh my goodness. Then you have like 100 lenses to talk about. Jamie says, I heard that, uh, sorry, Jamie says, hi from South Wales, UK. Hey, Jamie, very nice to see you. Thanks for being here. Exmida, hey, Exmida, nice to see you. Hi from Borno, Czech Republic. Hi, Esmida. Very, very nice to see you again. Jose Lopez says, Hello, Robin. Hey, Jose. Nice to see you. Hope you are well. I'm good. Thanks. As always, it's a pleasure to be able to catch your stream. Thank you so much. Thanks for being here. Gary says, Always a big fan. Good to see you, Robin. Hey, shout out to Gary. Gary is a content creator as well, and he specializes on... Uh, Micro Four Thirds. Let me see if I can find him on my subscription feed. Oh, my... Yep, Gary. So if you guys don't know who Gary is, I'm going to put his channel up here. I'm going to copy this link and put it down here. Very nice of you to drop by, Gary. Nice to see you. And yeah, guys, do check out Gary's channel. Um, go and say hi. And uh, yeah, check out some of his videos. I think he makes fantastic videos talking about some really cool cameras and lenses. I think Gary's favorite Micro Four Thirds camera is Lumix GX7. Correct me if I'm wrong, Gary. <laughs> Very nice to see you, Gary. And Jason. 
My goodness, Jason is an old friend, one of my amazing people that I've met here locally in Malaysia. Uh, and we are catching up this weekend. Looking forward to that catch up, Jason. Thank you so much for the super chat, Jason. <laughs> Jason says, wow, so sharp, so clear, so beautiful. See you on Sunday. Yes, see you, Jason. Jason, I'm testing out this new capture card that I just bought. Uh, it supports 4K live streaming. This is the first time I'm doing 4K live streaming. I don't think that many people are doing 4K and I've been warned that you need to have a powerful internet connection. You need to have a powerful machine. You need to have a powerful camera. Everything needs to be like top notch. And I'm not having I, I run like the cheapest internet subscription that i can find i'm paying like 20 dollars a month for my internet subscription uh i have like a five years old computer now a, a windows pc so it's not exactly like the latest and greatest and yet i'm streaming in 4k so hopefully everything goes well <laughs> jason our computer is running on the fifth year now do you realize that fifth year fifth year me and Jason, we bought our computers just before the pandemic hits. That's crazy, right? That's about four years ago. All right. Thank you so much, Jason, for the super chat. I appreciate that. Ken says, uh, it's talking to Yumi. Have you upgraded your EM5 yet? I'm looking for an upgrade. Huh? There are so many options. Hey, if you just if you want to stay with the EM5 uh, category, there's EM5 Mark III, there's OM5, or you can look at the EM1 Mark II, EM1 Mark III, or the latest OM1. If you're going to the Panasonic, there is always the G9 or GH56 series. These are excellent upgrades as well. I think G9 Mark II will be the best recommendation at the moment. Xmina says, 14 to 42 Mark II is quite okay with the lens, but it is sad that there is no lens hood provided as standard accessory with the lens. I disagree. The reason why Micro Four Thirds is so awesome is that the lenses are designed to be having telecentric design, whereas the, the lens circle covers a lot larger than necessary, the image circle of the sensor, right? So the light saturates the sensor a lot more than needed. And because of that, the pixels that's recorded on the image sensor, they are fully optimized and you suffer less flare problems. And let's face it, the only reason you use the lens hood is because you want to prevent flare. And it's quite hard to flare using Micro Four Thirds lenses. I've tried. And that's one of the awesome things about Micro Four Thirds, right? Carl Richard says, good evening, Robin. Hope you are well. Hey, Carl, good evening to you too. I'm doing great. And thanks for being here. Very, very nice to see you. <laughs> All right. HR Monroe says, I got the 12 to 50 electronic zoom with my EM5. I liked it and got some good pictures, but the, it was long and the power zoom was pointless. The manual zoom feels uh, very scratchy. Let me replace it with the 12 to 40 f 2.8 Pro. Yeah, as a kit lens, I think uh, it was it was not a bad lens. I understand that some people may not like the electronic zoom on the 12 to 50, but you have to understand, when this lens came out, it came out with the EM5, right? So this was, if I'm not wrong, the first, uh, the first weather sealed lens for Micro Four Thirds, which is the 12 to 50. And the EM5 was the first weather sealed Micro Four Thirds camera. So this kit comes with the EM5, this why weather sealed, weather sealed. And somehow Olympus was a little bit forward thinking, although they didn't go full on with the video specifications or the video side of camera. But uh, the reason why they use the power zoom is so that if you want to zoom during video, it is actually smooth. They're thinking about the video shooters, how they want smooth zooming action while they're recording video, right? Rather than the jerkiness using the manual zoom. But understand uh, for photography, I am not a videographer, so I don't care about the power zoom, honestly. I'm just speaking on behalf of the company. Like, I under understand where they're coming from. But as a photographer, I don't care about the slow power zoom. And like yourself, I also prefer to use the 12 to 40 f2.8 Pro. And the 12 to 40 f2.8 Pro is such a superior lens. It beats the 12 to 40 in almost every single way. <laughs> Xmina says, is the pancake version better than the previous extendable one? If you're talking about optical image quality, like the lens quality and the sharpness and everything, I think it's about the same. Yeah, and if you look at the lens construction, uh, I've, I've done the comparison looking at the, the, the diagram, right? The, the glass inside the lens from the old 14 to 42 and the pancake, it's exactly the same. It's just that they squish everything together. Somehow they managed to just 
squish it and make it like a very slim lens, <laughs> which is very strange. Yumi is talking to Ken. I have the EM5 Mark II, so I use the old batteries. My EM5 mode dial went faulty. Ah, oh, I think the mode dial went faulty because of the um, the con electronic contacts. It attracts dust. Somehow there's like dust and grime trapped in the electronic contacts, so that's why it went faulty. So if you can get someone to just open it up and clean the electronic contacts, then that should solve the problem. Alright, uh, let's continue on with the comment. Just want to make sure I don't miss any super chats. No, we did not. Alright. ATF says, good morning from California. Good morning to you too, ATF. Random question. If you could visit America, where would you like to go? <laughs> I will definitely visit uh, New York. Uh, well, it's, it's not for the ma many reasons that people would think. I have a cousin whom I'm quite close to living in New Jersey. And New Jersey is not far from New York. So it makes sense that uh, it's... it's it's easier for me to just go there. Maybe I can just crash at the place. That will save me a lot of uh, accommodation costs, right? And New York itself is like, hey, the Big Apple. Everyone wants to be there. And I've watched so many TV series and movies showing New York as the backdrop. So yeah, definitely it's one of the place, places that I want to visit. Another place which is like on the completely far like it's just nowhere near New York is Texas and the reason I want to go there is because I want to meet Kurt Tuck and Kurt Tuck is in Austin, Texas I think Kurt is an excellent photographer he's one of the photographers that inspires me so much and he, has, he doesn't know that he has so much influence in my photography style and I still read his blog today so yeah, I hope, I hope that answers your question Ken is talking to Hisham Monroe the instrument zoom is for video shooting to do dynamic zooming yes, I agree the meta zoom is not smooth I agree with you yeah, Richard says, thanks, no worries. <laughs> Jamie says, hi Robin, hey Jamie. Not a lens question, but a camera one. Do you honestly think it's worth upgrading from E1 Mark II to OM1? Um, it depends on what you do. If you do a lot of wildlife photography, if you do specifically bird shooting, I think that the bird detection AI subject tracking on the OM1, that itself is worth upgrading. The camera will just automatically find the bird inside the frame. All you have to do is just half press the shutter button. As long as the bird is in your frame, you'll find the face and the eye and it'll keep it in focus, right? Continuously uh, in focus. I think that's a huge plus if you do a lot of birding or wildlife photography. Other than that, uh, if you're like me, I don't do wildlife. I stay in the city and the only wildlife that we get are stray cats. Uh, we. I don't see much of improvement in the OM1 and I have talked about this uh, multiple times on my channel. You can just search Robin Wong on my channel, OM1. I have shared my honest thoughts on the OM1. I did encounter some issues. I'm not going to repeat here because that's a separate topic altogether. And because of these issues that I've encountered, they did affect the outcome of my professional shoots. It did slow me down and I did miss shots and that's not okay. So currently I'm using my EM1 Mark II as my main camera for my professional shoots. For my clients, I do portraits, I do live events, I do stage photography, concerts, uh, I do uh, a little bit of weddings. I still do a little bit of wedding photography there and here. And my main camera is EM1 Mark II and the camera has not failed me yet. In terms of image quality, resolution, dynamic range, high ISO. Both cameras are very similar. Some people claim that the OM1 is slightly better. Whatever improvement there is, like no matter how small it is, it is negligible. To me, it's basically the same. So if you ask me, if you already have the EMM Mark II, maybe stay with it. But if you're doing a lot of wildlife, if you're doing bird photography, then go for the OM1. You will not regret it. Gary says, I really love the Lumix 12-32 kit lens. Yes, same here. Excellent for travel. Had the older Olympus 14-42 non-EZ. Also a fantastic lens as well. Both are good kit lenses. Are you referring to this one, Gary? This 14-42, the Olympus, the classic ones. Man, I am collecting kit lenses. I should just one day do a video shooting with all these kit lenses. I think that would be so fun, right? <laughs> An idea to keep in mind. I right, just want to check something quickly. Ken is talking to Rebirth 2526. Uh, 20 f1.7, I'm not sure, but I did buy a GF3 with 14 f2.5 and 14 to 42 kit zoom. Yes. 
Darko says, good morning, sir. Hey, Darko, very nice to see you. How are you, Darko? Hope you're doing well. Thanks for joining the stream. Yumi says, I have the GF2 double lens bundle, 14 f2.5 and 14 to 42 kit lens. Yes, I think that's an excellent value for money, right? The 14 pancake is such a tiny lens and it's so sharp as well. I think the 14 f2.5 pancake is still the smallest or the tiniest autofocusing micro four thirds lens. Correct me if I'm wrong. If you have any other lens that's smaller than 14 f2.5 that has full autofocus capability. We're not talking about those uh, body cap lenses, right? Or any of the manual lenses from China. Uh, I think the Panasonic 14 f2.5 is the tiniest lens and that's really impressive. Ken says, I'm a fan of your videos, Gary. Yes, I think Gary makes some awesome, awesome videos. Busy Dad's Cooking says, hope you're doing great, Robin. I'm doing great. Thank you so much. I hope the same for you too. Uh, you must be so busy, right? Because you're cooking that. Uh, I love the Lumix 12 to 32, super small and super versatile. Yes, I think this is such an amazing, amazing lens. <laughs> Ton says, for street work, I love my Pan F and 14 to 42 electronic zoom. Yes, I think the 1442 pancake pairs very well with the Pan F. Gary says, thank you for the mention, Robin. You are the man. I used to own the GX7, but already sold it. Now my favorite is GX... Ah, oh, yes, this GX85. So sorry. I, I, saw, I saw your video. I am so sorry, man. Like, you guys have no idea. When I go live, like, I have so many things going in my mind. I have to talk to you guys, answering questions, and I have to look at my screen. In my screen, I have, like, multiple windows. There's the OBS stream. There's the chat window. There's, like, I have to make sure that my computer resources are okay. It's not overheating. I have to look at the camera, make sure everything is okay. I have to make sure the lighting, the microphone. It's like, I have, like, 10 things happening in my mind. So, like, when I, if I want to recall certain details, yeah, do forgive me if I get it wrong. I'm so sorry, Gary. <laughs> Yeah. Ken says, Robin, don't worry. Uh, MD Ryzen, f even five years ago, can be upgraded to the latest fifth generation. Just swap the CPU and update the, the BIOS. Yeah. But I have no reason to upgrade the processor. Hey, because the processor is still doing well. It's more than sufficient for me to do my work edits. Like after I shoot thousands of photographs, I'm, I have to process the photographs and, and deliver it to clients, right? The processing is fast. I have the the computer doesn't stutter it doesn't slow down i feel that it's as smooth as can be i don't think if i upgrade it to anything more it will improve my efficiency in editing right and that's my main source of income shooting for clients and delivering photographs after edits and then in terms of video editing i have no issue making my videos i know that i'm not shooting like 8K videos or shooting like 4K 120. I'm just shooting the regular 4K videos on my Olympus cameras and editing those videos on DaVinci Resolve. Uh, it's more than sufficient. And I can, pr I've been making like hundreds and hundreds of videos over the past three years. I've, I've just checked the summary I made uh, in the year 2023. I made 103 videos in that year. I published 103 videos. That's like one video in almost three or four days. <laughs> That's two videos every week, right? And yeah, I've been cons consistently doing it. The, the camera is, oh, sorry, not camera, the, the computer is not slowing down. So yeah, I'm going to use it for maybe another few years. And if it dies, I'll just buy a new one. Yeah. Darko says, Robin, what type of film stocks do you like? And can you be simulated on EM1 or OM1? Yeah, you must be very new, Darko. I don't like film and I've never shot film. And I don't get all this film simulation. I know a lot of my friends who shoot film, they keep telling me how, how they can achieve certain type of orgasm when they look at film grain. I don't. I think they are just ugly. And they, they, they like all those imperfections, all those characters, all those quirks, the, the weirdness of the film look, like the color is a bit off. I, I never get that. I prefer my photographs to look as close as to reality as they can. So every time I take a photograph, when I post process my photographs, I try to mimic what I remember seeing in real life. I hope that answers the question. Pinnacle Pete says, Robin, I live in New Jersey. Come on over. Yeah. If, if I do get over, I'll, I'll give you a shout, shout out. Hey. Chua says, I always joke for my friend. Just drew a hole on the cap. There will be a free kit lens pinhole. Unfortunately, I'm, I, I'm not tried yet. <laughs> Better than do it. Hey. <laughs> yeah, pinhole camera works, but yeah, we... 
Let's let's not do crazy things on our cameras, like drilling holes on any any parts of the camera. Xmina says, Lens hood have more use than anti-flare. It protects from rain, snow, damage. On my 40 to 150 and 75 to 300, I can see how lens hood helps contrast, but those were not bundled. Strange cost cutting. Not true. Uh, I think lens hood will affect the image quality more on the wider end of the lens. Let's say if you have an ultra wide angle like uh, 9mm or 7 to 14 or anything like 8 to 25, the wider the lens is, even the 12 to 40, right, at 12 millimeters, at that wider end, that's when the lens hood is critical because it prevents the light from, let's say this is the lens, uh, it prevents the light from coming in straight away from, from the sides, right? That's what causes the flare coming in from the sides. That's when white. But when your lens is so long, when it's a telephoto, especially if you're talking about 75 300 at 300, you don't really need uh, a, 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 what you call that, a lens hood anymore. And I've tested with or without lens hood. There's no difference, right? Uh, well, if you see a difference, if it makes you feel a little bit more confident in getting your shots, then go for it. I've done so many comparisons and I've come to conclusion that lens hood doesn't help, especially telephoto lenses. And I've made a video to talk about why I don't shoot with lens hood. <laughs> you can check out that video, right? You just go to my channel, Robin Wong, search lens hood. Uh, you see, uh, I've explained there. I'm not going to repeat here. Danielle says, I live about two and a half hours drive from New York City, but never go. I'm sure if I ever move away, I'll regret not to get advantage of being this close. Yeah, I thought like... Everyone wants to go there, right? It would be a good place to, to, to check it out and maybe do some photography as well. Ken Hong says, uh, Robin, for video autofocus, how good is the EM1 Mark II? I'm thinking of upgrading from EM10 Mark II. Well, if you have seen my recent videos on my channel, like the past five or six videos, I don't know if you've checked out my main channel, look at the autofocus. So all I did was just set up the camera on a tripod and I just stand and start talking. And even when I use the camera to do some B-rolls, close up on some products, everything is done with EM1 Mark II. Uh, my EM5 Mark III is now out with a friend. A friend is borrowing it for a personal project. So I don't have the EM5 Mark III, which was my regular camera for my video production on this YouTube channel. But recently, because the EM5 Mark III is not with me, I'm using the EM1 Mark II instead. And the video performance, the autofocus is flawless, if you ask me, right? And yeah, I don't think there's any issue whatsoever. Dung Yun says, hello, I use EM10 Mark III and 45 150 and 20 f1.7. Amazing lenses and thanks for being here. Nice seeing you. We're going to drink some coffee. Hmm. Ah, Just going to quickly check some stuff here. Okay, Chua is talking to Ken Hong. No worries, you guys keep talking to each other. I'm just going to skip this. This side to our screen. Hey, nice to see you here. How are you? Hi, Robin. Hello to you too. Watching from Boston. Uh, the kit lens I have is 18 to 55, then purchase it dedicated 35, 55, 70 to 300. That 18 to 55 is the default lens I use. May I ask on which camera system? Is it Canon, Nikon, or Sony, or Fuji? Yeah, 18 to 55 is a popular kit lens. Hey. Kicks of Texas says, when doing street and travel, I used to use my 12 to 32, but since I have changed to the Lumix 12 to 60 power optical image stabilization paired with the 20 f1.7, they make up 95% of my photography. Yes, the 12 to 60 is a great upgrade of a kit lens, right? I think it has a, a, a more versatile zoom range and it has image stabilization. So it depends on what kind of camera that you're using. And I understand a lot of Panasonic Micro Four Thirds cameras, they don't have built-in body image stabilization. So having a kit lens that has a powerful image stabilization like the 12 to 60, that actually can benefit your shooting, right? You can stabilize the shot a little bit better. GMT Photography and Media says, Jersey City in the United States, I hate lens hoods. Yes, I hate lens hoods as well. I'm with you here. Darko says, thanks for the answer on film. I know that I only do black and white on my medium format Mamiya because it's just too expensive even if I scan at home. Yeah. I think for medium format, it's worth going for film, hey, because it still has that certain look. Uh, medium format look, not specifically film. And we all know how rid ridiculous it is for digital medium format, the cost today. So yeah, I understand why people do uh, medium format film today. 
Carl Richards says the 12 to 32 is my perfect lens for a tiny setup. Yes, it's plastic, but it weighs nothing. The 35-100 f4 to 5.6 is a great lens to be paired with the 12 to 32. I know, right? Look at this. This is like the world's smallest interge interchangeable lens camera, and having that 12 to 32 kit lens on this GM one. It's just like a dream machine. It's so tiny, so compact. I just bring this around in like a small pouch with me walking around the city. This is a great street photography setup and this is also a great travel kit. I think it works wonders. Image quality is still excellent and autofocus is fast. Not much to complain, really. <laughs> Pinnacle Pete says the Zuko 14 to 42 Mark II was an excellent kit lens that you could often pick up for only extra $100 when buying an Olympus SLR. This lens currently sells new for $300. Wow. Are you talking about the the SLR version, which was for the for third time, right? Yeah. Lyle says, what makes a new kit lens not compatible if the firmware for camera is too old? I'm not aware of any compatibility issues. Any lenses, any of these kit lenses are compatible with any new cameras, right? Like I can mount this really old Olympus 14 to 42. This is like the first or second generation kit lens. And I can mount it on say the OM1 and the, the lens will still work wonders and there's no issue whatsoever, right? Uh, I'm not aware of any compatibility issue. If you can give a more specific example, maybe we can uh, solve that problem together. GMT Photography and Media says, best kit lens ever, Panasonic 12 to 32 for compact size and quality. Fuji 18 to 55 for max aperture f2.8 to f4 in comparison to others. Yeah. But the Fuji 18 to 55 f2.8 to f4 is also not cheap. Like I said just now, I, I was defining the scope for kit lens. So when you have a lens that costs that much, it has become a lens in a different category altogether. Then we can bring in that like Olympus 12 to, to 45 F4 Pro or Olympus 12 to 40 uh, F2.8 Pro and then there's Panasonic 12 to 60 F2.8 F4, right? And all these are excellent standard zoom pro grade lenses. And I think the Fuji 18 to 55 F2.8, that lens is not exactly a kit lens. And the kit lens that we're referring here today is a budget kit standard zoom lens that comes with entry-level cameras. All right. Wajira says, Hi Robin, what is the best grain setting for medium enlargement when I shoot with EM1 Mark II? Medium enlargement, grain setting. Are you talking about uh, when you are printing and you are upsizing the print, let's say that you are printing large and then the pixels is not enough for that large print and then there is that upscaling in terms of resolution. Is that what you're talking about? I have no experience in doing that. So what I do is just, I'll leave my photographs to the printer and I trust that the printer would know what he's doing. I have no experience in printing whatsoever, so I'm so sorry. And grain setting, like, I don't want to see grain in my photographs. <laughs> Hui Williams says, Mod Dao issues sorted by turning it around and around, forward and backwards several times quickly, which cleans the contacts. It works on kitchen oven dials. My wife thinks I'm genius engineer. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm not a genius, but I'm an engineer as well. And yes, it is, the contacts problem is caused by dust trapped in the contacts, right? Or grime. So if you can get rid of those, uh, like you said, quickly turning it, can solve the problem, right? But sometimes you just have to take it apart when this depends on where you live. If you live in a very dusty environment, then there's just too much dust, it doesn't come off. You do have to take it apart and clean the dust and then put it back together again. This side turret screen says, I use a Pentax DSLR and several other older Pentax cameras came out Pentax 10s to bundle the 18 to 55. Ah, so it's Pentax. Pentax, Pentax do come with amazing kit lenses. Hey, yeah, Pentax is another brand. I understand that earlier in the days, uh, the reason why kit lenses get very bad reputation was because Canon and Ni not Nikon, Nikon is still okay. Canon and Sony, they used to come up with really cheap, really lousy, really bad performing kit lenses, the 18 to 55 for the DSLRs. They're so soft, they don't have good contrast, the images look so bad. 
that you just want to upgrade your lens immediately. Like, I understand why people back in those days, when they got a kit lens, they just want to throw it away and just buy a new lens immediately. Like, I understand. But these days, because the kit lenses like this uh, Panasonic 12-32 is so tiny, and yet it's so sharp, it's performing so well. And yet this lens has image stabilization, right? Uh, there's no reason to upgrade unless you have something specific you want to do with your lens. Let's say you want a little bit more shallow depth of field or you want a longer reach. Let's say you're doing wildlife or you want uh, to do macro photography, you have to go close. So these lenses allows you to do more specific nature kind of photography. But if you just want to do a general shooting, you just want a standard zoom. I think kit lenses today from Micro Four Thirds especially, they are so awesome. And I always encourage newcomers or beginners to photography to shoot with kit lenses because these lenses are what you start with. You don't have to spend more money. Get to know the camera better first. It's important for you to learn the basics of photography first before it just buy an expensive lens and not, not knowing what to do with the lens and not making the best use of the lens, right? So upgrade your skills first, get to know the camera better, get to know yourself using the kit lens, spend some time with it, then upgrade to a better lens. Adrian says the 14-42 EZ is an excellent lens in terms of image quality and size. However, I think I'm on the third one because the previous one just breaks after a while. I wish it wasn't so fragile. Yeah, mine is still working, thankfully. Uh, the 14-42 EZ, I understand a lot of people have the flex cable problem because of uh, some connection issues inside the lens. I think that's the price to pay when you make the lens so tiny. I've also had friends or I uh, heard people writing to me complaining about the Panasonic 12-32 breaking apart because they turn the lens the wrong way and the lens just come off <laughs> yes these lenses are fragile so when you use it please handle with care Ken says is uh is your problem with the more no I have no problem with, with any issue whatsoever mine still works hey Neil says, what's the difference between a large pepperoni pizza and a struggling photographer? A large pizza can fit a family of four. Ah. Only for once, right? It's just one, one, one pizza and then you have, can only fit for, for one meal. But if you are a struggling photographer and if you still can find some jobs, you still can feed your family more than one meal, right? <laughs> Rohit says, are F4 lenses good enough? I'm looking for versatility like landscape and outdoor portraits. I don't shoot in extreme low light. Can bokeh be a concern for F4? If you want shallow depth of field, if you want as much blur as possible, then may I suggest you look at at least F1.8 lenses. Uh, these lenses are not expensive if you, use, if you find them in the used market. For example, the Olympus 45 F1.8 or the Panasonic 42.5 F1.7. Find one of these lenses, then that will solve your background blur issue, right? You can render portraits with compressed background perspective, really nice, flattering look because the head and the body looks proportionate, everything looks flattering, uh, yet you get this nice bokeh, background is blurry, you can isolate a subject, just go for this f1.7, f1.8 lens, that will solve your problem, it doesn't cause a lot of problem. Uh, but F4 lenses for like general zoom, for landscape, for general photography, for environment, but the portraits where you don't want to blur the background, you want to see, you want to put the background into a photograph to add context for better storytelling, then F4 is a good lens. Adrian says, he's talking to Ken, it's the flex zoom cable like what Robin says. Got to see this working great. Hope mine will too. Love it. <laughs> no worries. All right, I want to share some photographs. I've called on with the comments. Do keep the comments coming. I'll get back to them as soon as I can. But yeah, the reason why I'm doing 4K live stream, we're almost on for one hour now. No problem so far. Whoo! <laughs> and I do want to share some, some photographs that I've taken uh, with this. Lumix GM1 and the 12-32 and uh, I have shared them before not sure if you guys see them in my social media but uh, first some coffee hmm, coffee first hmm. all right let's see if I can go to this sample so these photographs were taken a few months ago my friend Azul Adnan who is going to give a talk next week on Thursday. He has also released a book very recently. And that event was a talk to promote the book and to talk about the process of making the book. So Azul complained to me, and I mean, it's a general uh, grumble that we have among us photographers that photographers often go to events and they will 
give talks or they'll attend like a gathering or whatever, but we seldom take photographs of each other. All right. Or we do take photographs, but we take lousy photographs, like snapshots. So in that situation, I, was, I tried my best to, first of all, I have to be respectful because Azul is giving a talk. So I cannot be like a working photographer going all over the place and like be in his face getting my photographs. Right? I'm not paid to do this. So because I'm not paid to do this, I try to be uh, as discreet as possible. That's why I decided to use this GM1. It's so small, so tiny. It's not like a large DSL size camera with a big lens. So I used a small camera and small lens, and the lens I used was this 12 to 32. And of course, I have other lenses, which I'll talk about, uh, which I use for that shoot. So... Yeah, this is the shoot that I did for Azul uh, a few months ago uh, at Chloe Hotel. And yeah, this is just like a selection of 11 or 12 photographs to go through. Yep. So this is Azul <clears throat> uh, talking about his book. His book is Jalan. All right. And yeah, the, this 12 to 32 lens is just perfect because at 12 millimeters, uh, it is just wide enough for to cover the entire area. And if you are an event photographer, you know how important it is to have a wide angle coverage to show the surrounding area to establish the location, right? Right, and I just want to show from the front. And if you are an event photographer, it's important for you to move your ass. You have to move around to capture a different variety of shots, different composition. It's good to have the people, the audience, as well as the presenter. And of course, then you have a wider shot and you can go in and zoom in to get a tighter shot of the audience, the facial expression as well. Right, that's Azul. This is not taken with the 12 to 32. This was shot with the 40 to 150 f4 to 5.6 Olympus lens. Obviously, it's a telephoto lens. I don't want to walk all the way up in front of him and just point the camera in front of his face. Right, it's so rude. He's doing a presentation. I have to shoot from a distance. I have to respect him. So a tele lens is the way to go. Uh, just to have a few tight shots of Azul giving his talk. Right, uh, this is also the 40 to 150 Olympus lens. And then it's back to the 12 to 32 kit lens just to show the presentation and him together. Uh, yeah. So if you guys are free next week, please check out Azul's talk at uh, Geospace on Thursday. I'll be there as well. It's Azul talking about his book. And do support local artists. Hey, Azul just published his book. I think he's still selling them. You can get this book from him. It's a collection of his photographs. Right, there's a Q&A session. I have to go in front to capture Azul answering some questions. All right. And yeah, the group photograph of everyone attending the event. Uh, some familiar faces and my friends there. There's the Rippy that I know. Yep. And some fun shots uh, to cap off the day. All right. And these photographs are in full 4K. <laughs> Wow, I managed to share the entire uh, uh, set of photographs. Uh, of course, there's not a lot of photographs. I uh, managed to share this without any hiccups whatsoever. So yeah, uh, all those were, except for a few shots taken with a long lens, they were shot with this uh, Lumix GM1 and uh, 12 to 32. A uh, very small combination. Good if you don't want attention. You can move around quick, uh, quickly and yet you still deliver really great results. I thought the results were really good. Alan, hey, Alan is a friend from Kuching. It's also an amazing wedding photographer from Kuching. Hi, Alan, how are you? Uh, we should catch up very, very soon. I'm flying home to Kuching for Chinese New Year. We'll have our coffee, kolomi. There are lots to catch up on. Ken says, talking to Adrian. You guys keep talking to each other. Lord says, potato camera? What potato camera? I don't understand. Can you elaborate? GMT Photography and Media says, I think F4 is a great aperture for daylight to just leave wide open and document without worrying of missing focus, especially at wide angles. You'll be surprised. Even at F4, there is a chance of missing focus. Like People keep saying, ah, oh, you know micro photos, just use F4, right? Everything is in focus. That's not true. That's only true if you shoot at wide angle. But once you zoom, like you zoom to uh, 25, uh, 50 millimeters, or even 100 millimeters, you still can get plenty of blur in the background. <laughs> Dr. Harris, how are you? Dr. Harris is a friend. Uh, we do a lot of street photography together. We just did a street photography session last Sunday together at uh, Kampong Baru. Uh, Dr. Harris, he says, Azu Anand, don't know him. <laughs> Funny, because Azu was the one lead leading the walk last Sunday. Right. Uh, Rohit says, 108 live watching, only 52 likes. You deserve more. Oh, thank you so much, Rohit. You are being so kind. All right. Uh, Time check, it is 
almost 11 o'clock and we have been live for one hour. I hope you enjoy the slideshow that I did. I have another set of photographs which I'll share in a while. But now uh, I want to keep myself hydrated. I'm going to drink some water. Hmm. Ah. Yeah, I gotta stay hydrated. Hey, gotta take care of my health. And Dr. Harris said on Sunday, like, we have to drink every half an hour or so. I think I did not follow the advice, doctor. So sorry. And uh, yeah, followed by the gulps of water, I'm gonna have some coffee. Yeah, coffee is life. Hmm. Ah. Just making sure everything is in order. I didn't miss anything. Okay, that's great. Now, the reason why I want to talk about kit lens in this live stream is because I believe kit lenses are important. And I believe newcomers to photography should start with kit lenses. I see too often that a lot of my friends or a lot of newcomers to photography, once they buy the camera, they use it for like a few days or a few weeks and they immediately decided that they don't like the kit lens and they dump it aside and they never touch the kit lens again and they upgrade to pro grade lenses and then they upgrade to like those crazy expensive lenses right the f1.8 f1.4 lenses the pro grade lenses and to them it's like oh kit lenses are not good enough kit lenses they are not sharp, they don't produce a uh, nice enough bokeh, they can't blur the background off and kit lenses are just not good, right? That's what they think. And they think that to take the photography to the next level, they must upgrade lenses. And I don't blame them because if you go around YouTube, or you go around uh, everywhere online, that everyone will say that, ah, you know, you, you have to get this lens, that lens, they'll definitely make you a better photographer. You, this is a must have lens. But here's the thing, if you are starting out as a photographer, if photography is new to you, you're still grappling with the concept of the fundamentals like shutter speed, ISO and aperture. You're under, trying to understand the exposure basics. You're still trying to figure out your voice in photography. You don't know what you're doing. You don't even know what you want to do or pursue in photography. And you're just getting to know the camera. You're, you're starting out basically like you're, you're starting out from zero, right? Upgrading too soon, uh, throwing aside the kit lens too soon is not helping things. I think kit lens is, is good to start with. It helps you to know yourself a little bit better because it has a versatile zoom range. Then you can understand, oh, maybe I prefer 50 millimeters more. Oh, maybe I prefer to shoot something with longer focal length. Uh, I think kit lens also is good for you to help to understand at least the camera basics, right? The white balance, uh, shooting JPEG versus RAW. Uh, what does shutter speed do? What does the aperture, the F number, how does it affect your photograph? What if you increase the ISO numbers? Should you stay with ISO 100? All those things you have to experiment. You have to go out and the more you shoot, the more you play with the camera, the more you play with the settings, the more photographs you capture, then the more you understand the camera until one day you don't even have to think about the settings anymore. It just becomes second nature and you can just operate the camera on the go and get the camera to do what you want it to do, right? You are the master, you control the camera, you tell the camera exactly what you want and the camera will give you the results that you want. And in order to reach that level of shooting discipline, in order to get that efficiency or proficiency, Having a kit lens is not bad. For the first 10,000 shots, it's gonna be crap, right? And having a kit lens to get that 10,000 shots is fine. Even if you upgrade it to say a, a, a zoom, pro zoom lens, a uh, uh, $2,000 lens, right? A uh, high grade lens immediately. It will not improve your photograph a little bit because you still don't understand how the camera works. You still don't understand how to fully maximize the potential of the lens and the camera. You still don't even know what you're doing in your photography. You don't even know how to optimize the lighting. You don't even know how to control the subject or you don't even know what you're doing. You don't even know what you are saying through your photography. And if, if you don't get all these fundamentals right, you can use the most expensive cameras and lenses in the world and still produce subpar results. That's the reality and that's the truth, right? So if you are starting out, if, 
for your first year, second year, don't shy away from the kit lens. Stay with the kit lens as long as you can. And once you figure out what you want to do, once you're comfortable with the camera, once you know how the camera works, then upgrading to a better lens is not too late. And even after you already have this upgrades, right? You have better lenses, you have higher grade lens. You can still keep the lens. Like I have Olympus 240 Pro. I shoot with 75 f1.8, 45 f1.8. I have 25 f1.2 Pro. I have a plethora of, of pro grade lenses. And I still shoot with this uh, 12 to 32 kit lens, the Lumix, which I pair with smaller cameras like this GM one. When I travel or sometimes when I do street photography, it's still so tiny, so small, it's so versatile. I have just shown in a slideshow of images that I've used this for an event coverage, which my friend Azul is quite happy with, right? So yeah, let's look at comments. Do you guys agree with me? Or you say, oh, you can dumb the kit lens immediately, just start with a pro grade lens. Let me know in the comments. Michael says, hi Robin, to be honest, I learned a lot from Olympus kit lens through your blog, which I read before I, if I remember correctly, the title was Maximizing Your Kit Lens. Yes, I remember writing that article. And I also remember making a similar theme video also talking about tips on maximizing or optimizing the use of your kit lens. Yes, and some of the tips, if I remember correctly, is like uh, go as close as you can, make sure you hold the lens properly, uh, utilize the close-up shooting, and yeah, and, and you don't have to shoot wide open, you can stop down for, for a little bit better sharpness. And Trick all says, hello from Washington, DC. Hey, Trick, how are you? Very nice to see you here. Hope you are doing well. Animal Infotainment says, I think we still need some new lenses. The 9 f1.7 filled one of the big gaps in the system. We'd like to see a 14 f1.7, f1.8. Yes. I, th I love the 9 f1.7. I have it. Uh, I use it for my vlogs. I also use it for my jobs. Although I don't use it a lot because sometimes I just need that one or two shots for to establish the location, right? The wide angle coverage. Uh, but it is a very important lens and I think it makes a huge difference because it has f1.7 bright aperture and the lens is so tiny and it gives fantastic image quality. And I agree that we need like a 14 f1.8. Uh, yeah. Who knows, maybe Panasonic or OM Digital Solutions will come up with the lens. 14 will be great. But having said that, um, I know that we want a 14, a true 28 millimeters equivalent, 14 f1.7, 8 but there is a 15 f1.7 lens from Panasonic. And I think that 15 f1.7 is an excellent lens. And you are looking at me through that lens. That lens is on the camera that's streaming now. That's the 15 f1.7. It has a Leica badge on the lens. I personally love the 15 f1.7. I use it for my live streams. I use it to make my YouTube videos. I also use it for my street photography if I want to use wide angle, which is not a lot. I prefer to shoot with uh, 50 equivalent or longer. But at times when I want to do wide angle street photography for my micro four thirds setup, then I will bring out the Panasonic 15 f1.7. Yeah, so for now, Maybe you can check out the 15 f1.7. I think that can satisfy your need. I know it's not exactly the same because it's 30 equivalent versus a true 28, but hey, it's still a good lens, right? Chua says, I used to have the 14 to 42 EZ and then I added an auto lens cap for it before. I really like its concept and design, but unfortunately the result image quality was unacceptable. Why unacceptable? I thought the 14 to 42 is quite an amazing lens. It is very sharp, uh, wide open, and from 14 all the way to uh, 42, and it does have very good close up shooting. I thought I get really, really sharp results from it. Of course, if you compare with 12 to 40 f2.8 Pro, it's on a different level, right? You're paying a lot more for that lens, and that lens is a pro grade lens, and it's like so much larger, right? It's f2.8, and it's super sharp, and everything. It's nice bokeh whatsoever, it's f2.8, right? And it's, it's a different lens, but for a kit lens, I thought the 14 to 42 is an excellent lens. Yeah, 3D print, print creator says coffee does dehydrate instead of hydrate, <laughs> but coffee is life, and coffee gives life at the same time, right? K says I really miss my 12 to 32 Panasonic. I gave it to a friend. I really, it really is a great kit lens. Yeah, get it back from your friend or buy a new one or not new but uh buy one from the used market right from here in malaysia you can buy one for less than 100 us dollars i can find one for like 80 us dollars or something ken says question about aperture if i used 
a Canon 50 f1.8 adapted on micro four thirds, will the equivalent aperture become f0.9 or 3.6? It becomes 3.6. So that 50 f1.8 lens becomes an equivalent 100 f3.6 unless you have a, what you call it, focal reducer or those kind of weird adapters that converts the lens and make it like from f1.8 to f1.2 or something. Uh, I don't recommend using those focal reducer adapters unless you really know what you're doing. But if you just adapt it like without any focal reducer, then it becomes double, everything doubles. So it becomes, instead of 50 f1.8, it becomes 100 f3.6. And Trey also says, recently got the 9 f1.7. I'm surprised how more wide than my 12 millimeters. Having fun deciding composition. Yes, it is a lot wider, right? So at a wide angle, every one millimeters become increasingly wider. Like people will say, ah, but you know, like from, from eight millimeters to seven millimeters, there's not much difference. That is not true. And then, or like, oh, you know, like the Lawa has a six millimeters, but Olympus has a seven to 14, it's autofocus, but seven to six, it's a huge difference in terms of wide angle coverage, right? 3D print creator says, my experience with people is a lot different. I see people starting with way too expensive gear instead of just a simple kit lens. Maybe a difference from where I live instead of where you live. No, no, I'm, I'm saying the same thing. That's why I'm complaining, right? It's my rant. I'm saying that I see a lot of my friends or a lot of people, the newcomers to photography, they just want to throw away the kit lens too soon and they want to upgrade immediately. That's why I'm discouraging people from doing that. That's why I'm encouraging people to stay with the kit lens because you can benefit a lot more from the kit lens and then after a while using the kit lens you know yourself you know the camera better then you upgrade it's not too late by then you will know how to fully utilize the better lens yeah seal says hello managed to catch the stream a tad late though no worries seal i'm just happy that you are here and thanks for dropping by Animal Infotainment says the multiple 14 to 42 lenses from both Olympus and Panasonic are mid core at best. The 12 to 32 and 1260 Lumix are very good though for beginners. Same with 12 to 45. That's not true. I personally think that the 14 to 42 from Olympus, whether it's the non EZ version, the earlier, the big one, the 14 to 42. And the Pancake 14 to 42, I think both of these lenses are excellent and i've made multiple blog entries and i've made multiple videos talking about how great these lenses are in terms of sharpness in terms of uh, image quality the contrast the rendering i thought they are doing really good for a kit lens it's definitely great value for money yeah of course you can compare like you know with 12 to 40 or like 12 to 60 right but these lenses cost a lot more it's not fair to compare it that way Seal says, Robin, most of the pictures I've sold so far were taken with the 14 to 42 uh, version 2R. I think it's this one, right? <laughs> or maybe it's, uh, no, not this one. There's a newer version than this one, the 2R. This is the 14 to 42 Mark II. And so R version has a different design. Yes. Yeah, the lens is great. See, uh, referring to an animal infotainment, see, like people actually sell photographs taken with that lens. And I personally have taken some amazing shots with these kit lenses. John Young says, two Nikon Z50s and an 1850 and 50 to 50 kit lenses. This is my travel kit in portrait. It's uh, $1,500. Amazing quality. Thank you, Robin. No worries. Yeah, kit lenses are awesome. K says, I really like the micro four thirds cap. I know, right? It's so awesome. <laughs> I'm going to drink to that. Hmm. Ah. Eric Lundquist says, hello, Entrick. Also from DC, Fairfax. Location of working at Union. All right, you guys are talking to each other. No worries. Rob S says, Hi, Robin. Hey, Rob. How are you? Do you ever reflect on why Olympus made the 75 f1.8 of all the focal lengths for portrait or short telephoto? Why 75? I love the 75. Why not? I thought it's got sent. When that lens came out, I was like, wow, this is a must-have lens. And it took me a while to save up to buy that lens. That time I wasn't a photographer yet, a full-time photographer yet. And that time I was still working uh, as an engineer, right? So yeah, I was having a lousy... Engineers in Malaysia pay peanuts anyway 
Uh, I thought that lens is great. It's, it gives 150 millimeters equivalent. Like for me, I do a lot of stage stuff, stage shooting. I shoot mini concerts. I shoot events like opening ceremonies or product launches or things that happen uh, that I need to shoot from a distance. I thought the 75 f1.8 is excellent. It gives me the sufficient reach because I am a, an official photographer. I can get close to the stage. So 75 is more than sufficient. And because it's f1.8, I still can get plenty of blur in the background, shallow depth of field, the bokeh is excellent, and that lens is super sharp. Like, yeah, if you ask me why on this mini, I'll say why not? I thought it's the perfect lens. <laughs> I use it so much. Epi says, Selamat malam Robin, hello from the Netherlands. Hey Epi, how are you? Nice to see you here. Daniel says, I would argue learning how your aperture affects your photos from kit lenses can be hard because of most of kit lenses don't have F range large enough to create enough difference to understand it well. Well, I disagree with you. I can create background blur shooting for kit lens, even doing portraits. If you check out any of my kit lens uh, portrait videos, you can see that I have background blur. There is a set of photographs that I'll share with the Panasonic 12 to 32 soon, uh, maybe in a while after I read a few more comments. And in that video, you can see that I do have some background blur using kit lenses as well. So I disagree with that. Seal says, it's talking to Rob S, I think it's for replicating the popular 135mm effect. Yeah, maybe. Uh, but still, I think it is a great lens. I think it's a fantastic lens. And Triol says, the Panasonic 12 to 60 has been a good kit lens with a nice focal range. Yes, it has been. As Komi says, I believe that's the reason we have great condition used cameras and lenses because newcomers don't understand how to use them but still invest big numbers and ditch them for a month. I know, right? And the, the problem with a lot of people is that they don't know what they want and they don't know what they are doing. Two very big problems. Because they don't know what they want to do with their photography, right? They just buy, oh, their friends tell them, oh, you know that this this uh 50 f1.4 is a must-have lens. Oh, you know that uh the 85 f1.4 is, is an excellent lens, just buy them, and then they buy the lens and they never use the lens. Or they just use it once or twice, it's like, nah, it's not for me, right? And then the second problem is that they don't know what they're doing. Like they have the lens, but they don't know how to use it. You see, it's like it takes some experience and some know-how, at least some basics in photography to fully utilize whether it's a camera or the lens or the flash or some equipment, right? It takes certain experience to know what you are doing. They just don't know what they're doing and they don't know the, to, to use the lens or the cameras. It's just, to me, it's, it's like it's a waste of opportunity. You have such an expensive lens or equipment, but you're not making the best out of it, right? It's just so sad. 3D Print Creator is talking to Rob S. I think 75 is the best lens ever. Yes, it's the best lens ever. I don't get it. Why Why not a pro lens? Oh, of course, it's not weather sealed, so it's not pro, right? And when I have enough physical space, it's my lens of choice for portraits and fine art photography. Yeah. The image quality from that lens at one time, I'll tell you that it's like the sharpest lens ever. Like, it's so sharp. SRV Bro says, Sir, should I buy an Olympus EM10? Why not? Depends on what you do, right? The EM10 is designed to be beginner friendly. It is designed at an entry level OMD. So OMD has three different lines. EM1 is the flagship, EM5 is in the middle, and EM10 is the lowest. The difference from EM10 and the rest is that the EM5 and EM1, they are weather sealed, they have magnesium alloy body, minus the latest EM5, which has plastic. But the EM10 has no weather sealing, has plastic body. Not plastic though, I think it's combination of plastic and metal. Uh, mostly metal, if I remember correctly. And then the EM10 has lesser features. It doesn't have dual cut slots. It, has, uh, it doesn't have the latest processor. It doesn't have the latest image sensor. It doesn't have, have face detection autofocus, which helps uh, like this video continuous autofocus. It sticks into my face. The EM10 may not be as efficient as that. Uh, and then the EM10 may not be suitable for video making because it doesn't have uh, an audio jack input for microphones. Other than that, if you're doing street photography, I think EM10 is excellent. It has powerful image stabilization. It has really good electronic viewfinder. It has tilt screen, touch screen. It gives excellent image quality. The focusing is still very fast. I think all around it's an excellent camera for a beginner. All right. Ken Hong is talking to a 3D print creator. Yeah, looking for the 75 is quite rare. 
it is available new though. I think if you're looking for a used market, of course, because those who have used it would have kept it, right? Because it's such a great lens. <laughs> right. Uh, as Ari Vro says, or my phone camera is enough because I feel like EM1 is old and I'm confused. Why are you confused? If you have the EM1, Mark 1, then stay with it. I think EM1 is still a great camera, right? Uh, EM1 is better than EM10. Yeah. Nicholas says, I tried using the 12 to 32, but sadly I dropped it in the mud while trying to mount it on the EM5 Mark 3, and there's now dirt in it. Would it be safe to use? I did get the 12 to 40 Pro, but it's heavier. Well, send it for servicing. Hey, uh, look for Panasonic official service or any lens repair service centers. Uh, get them to open up the lens and have a thorough cleaning. Uh, that would be great. Seal says about the 14 to 42, I'm a magazine photographer, so there is no need to go overboard with megapixel count. The lens is way more than enough to give cracking sharp results. Yeah, I know, right? Definitely, the lens can produce sharp results. Ken says, Robin, I wonder if you need to, to tweak the autofocus setting to make jump from your face to the lens you are showing. No need. You just set uh, all focusing point, and then there is the face, human face detection autofocus. Just enable it, and it'll just find my face automatically. Yeah. Nicholas says, also love your content. Always great to see your positive attitude and feedback. Thank you. No worries. And thanks for being here, Nicholas. I appreciate you. SRV Bro says, and hello from India. No worries. Very nice to see you here. Thanks for being here. Animal Infotainment says, have you tried the Sigma 56 f1.4? How do you think it compares with Olympus 75? On paper, I prefer the faster aperture and wider field of view on the Sigma. It's also smaller and lighter, at least on paper. I, on the other hand, prefer the longer reach because I'm a, an event photographer, I shoot stage, uh, sometimes I shoot music and uh, uh, things happening on, on like mini concerts or this live musicians performing, right, on an orchestra or a live theatre work. So I prefer it to be longer. 56 is not long enough. I think 75 is just enough, right? Uh, then secondly, yes, the f1.4 is definitely better than f1.8, no question on that, but it's also not a right comparison between these two lenses because 56 and 75 they are corresponding to very different focal lengths 56 is like 112 uh, whereas the 7500 is 150 so like I can't use 56 in a situation where I'm using 75 you get what I mean and I'm sure let's say you, you prefer a wider focal length right so in a situation when you are using the 56 you will not use a 75 as well. So it's like, you can't put these two lenses together. They're just so different. And I personally would think that 56 is, is in the middle of nowhere. I, sh I love the 45 f1.8, or if you're using a Panasonic, it's 42.5 f1.7. I love it for portraits. So in terms of full frame, that's about equivalent to 85. So I love that for, for portraits, right? And I think that 56 is, is a little bit too long. I don't even use 75 for my portrait shooting. I use 45 most of the time. And 45, is just nice. You're not too far away. You're so close enough to, to, can, to, to to be able to communicate effectively with your portraits because let's face it, if you're doing a lot of portrait work, you want to be able to communicate effectively with your, with your subjects, right? So if you're using 56, you have to step back a few more steps and you have to start to shout. And I think that's not very good. <laughs> but that's just me, that's just me. GMT Photography Media says, background blur is a matter of distance from the subject aperture and focal length. A kit lens can create bokeh if zoom in. And the subject is far from the background, that would be blurred. That is correct. That is correct. Rob S says, Lumix 12 to 32 still sells well to this day. In fact, it costs more than my 12 to 45 f4. Really? That is not the case here though. Like 12 to 45 is expensive. It costs like yeah, it's really expensive. And in fact, you can find the Lumix 12 to 32 here in used market in Malaysia for like what, 70 US dollars or 80 US dollars? You definitely can't find that price for the 12 to 45 Pro lens. GMT Photography and Media says, I created bokeh with a 1 over 1.7 inch sensor with Nikon P72800. Yeah, that is true. If you want shallow depth of field, you have a blur background, you just need to know how to create them. Norm says, good day, Robin. Hey, Norm, very nice to see you here. How are you? I've only had two kit lenses, the 20 f1.7 and the 40 to 150. They both perform very well. 40 to 150 captures images way above its price. That is true. I think that's uh, 
I wouldn't consider it as a kit lens, although it does come as a bundle with certain, depends on what combo you're buying. Uh, but I do see it as a different lens. When we talk about our definition here in this discussion specifically, we refer to budget standard zoom lenses that comes bundled with entry-level cameras. So in that sense, it's like the Lumix 12-32 or the Olympus 14-42 EZ. Norm says, 40 to 50 may not be sharp corner to corner, but that doesn't always matter. I've got the 75 f1.8. Yeah, the 75 f1.8 is such an excellent lens. Chua says, I very love my 15 f8 and 9 f8 uh, body cap lens very much. They are very lightweight and fun for my street photography. Just curious, can we call them also kit lens? No, they are not kit lenses because they are not standard zoom and they don't have autofocus. May I tempt you, Chua, with the 7 Artisans 18mm f6.3? Hmm, I think the 7 Artisans is a better lens than Olympus uh, kit lenses, although you can't really compare them because the Olympus is 9, 15, 7 Artisans is 18, but the, for street photography, the 18 is more equivalent to 35, which is a classic focal length for street photography that a lot of people like, and it's at 6.3, which is wider than f8, it's a little bit brighter, and it's made of full metal body and it has manual focusing ring which the Olympus uh, body cap lenses, both the 9 and 15, has that tiny, fiddly, really lousy operating switch, which I really hate. It's so hard to use, as opposed to the uh, 7 Artisans body cap lens, which you can just turn the entire manual focusing ring. I thought, and it's cheaper, it costs new. If you buy new, it's actually half the asking price of both the Olympus lenses, right? Daniel says, I have actually bought one second hand and never used kit lens that comes with a Sony A7 as an upgrade to my mom's Sony A6 with kit lens as a Christmas gift. Huge difference and was dirt cheap. Huh, interesting. Yumi says, I had the original Olympus 14-42 and 40-150 as a kit with the EPL-1. It was my ticket into the world of Micro Four Thirds and it took on holiday with me. Really enjoyed using this, small and compact. Yeah, I think the small and compact size of Micro Four Thirds kit lens is what made them so amazing, right? Like this uh, GM-1 and 12-32 is such a compact combination and like if you want to travel with this, it's like you're carrying nothing at all. So you want a minimal footprint, you just can't beat it, right? Hmm. 3D printing credit says for portraits I use 42.5 Leica or the 75. Yeah, if you want to maximize the background blur, I think these are the two lenses from Micro Four Thirds that can get you the results that you need. Hazan says, I have the EM1 Mark II, which is best rounder lens for that. I have the 12 to 50. I don't think there is a best rounder lens. I personally think that you buy the lens that suits your needs and everyone has different needs. Like a uh, macro photographer will say, macro lens is the best all round lens. Or a bird photographer will say, oh, 100 to 400 is the best all round lens, right? Or a uh, let's say a portrait photographer will say, oh, the 45 f1.2 is the best all-around lens for them. So it all depends on what you do with your photography and that specific things that you do. You find the lens that does that gives you the best results. Ken says, uh, Daniel, I have the ANS3 and 1855. Robin, would you like to review it one day? Yeah. Uh, the thing about reviewing things. I don't do reviews for older products. It's more like, hey, I find something cheap in the market or my friends has it and I borrow it. And then if that particular product has something weird, something unusual, something worth talking about, then I will do a video to talk about these weird features. For example, the Sigma uh, DP2 Quattro that I did recently, it has an unconventional uh, Foveon sensor design versus the traditional Bayer sensor RGB design, right? So because it has this Foveon sensor, although the pixel count is very low, it produces very, very high density or high pixel quality. It's almost like medium format sharpness in the camera, which other cameras can't achieve. So that has something to talk about. That's why I made a video to talk about that. And then, for example, uh, I bought the Nikon D600 uh, full frame. I bought it cheap. I found it really, really cheap. I bought it for like 800 ringgit or was it 700 ringgit? I can't remember. And the reason why I bought it and made a video to talk about it is because, I don't know if you guys know this, the Nikon D600 was banned in China. 
Why was it banned in China? Because there was a manufacturing defect that Nikon didn't admit. And China just said, nope, Nikon, pull all your cameras from the shelves. You're banned from selling this camera. That is a story that's worth making a video to talk about. You get what I mean now? And then I also made a video to talk about the Nikon One system because I was curious about a one inch interchangeable lens cam camera and a Nikon One inch failed. And why did it fail? That curiosity was a story for me to talk about in my making, for me to make a content, right? And uh, coming back to the Sony NAX3, I think it's an excellent camera, don't get me wrong. If you still have one today, please continue using it. I think you can achieve great results with the camera. It's very small, autofocus is fast, you get really nice image quality. But then again, if I have the camera, I don't think I can come up with a story to talk about it. And if I don't have a compelling story, and then the content is just about gear and it's empty, right? And that will not be good for me. <laughs> I hope you see, you see my point, I hope you understand what, where I'm going with this. As RV says, I'm getting an Olympus EM10 Mark I for $150 with the kit lens or should I save my money for a better camera? All I want to do is just take portrait and travel photography. I think EM10 Mark I is an excellent camera with a kit lens. You can do a lot with it, especially if you want to travel. It's a very small combination. And if you want to do portraits, just specifically portraits, I would suggest that you add the 45 f1.8. That will allow you to, to do like a flattering, a glamour look or the fashion kind of look. And you can have some nice blur background compressed background as well. In fact, if you look at most of my videos on my main channel, if you get that nice blurry background with my talking head shots, they were all shot with the 45 f1.8. Gregor says, I got the 12 to 40 f2.8 with the EM5 Mark II. It is great, but definitely it was too big for the camera. The day I bought the EM1 Mark III, now size seems to be fine. Yeah. The EM1 Mark III or the EM1 series cameras, they were designed to balance the 12 to 40 very, very well. You fit the 12 to 40 on any of the EM1 series cameras or even the OM1, it just feels right. <laughs> 3D Print Creator is talking to Norm. Uh, it's different types of 40 to 150. Yeah, I think there is. there are two types. The original 40 to 150, and then there is the R version. The R stands for revised. And basically, it's just cosmetic difference. Maybe there is some different coating use. I can't remember the specifics, but the main difference is cosmetics. SRV says, thanks for the information. No worries. I'm glad I can share as much as I can. <laughs> Time check is 30 minutes past 11. I'm going to drink more coffee. Hmm. Norm says, hey Robin, how does the 12-32 lens work on the EM1 Mark III? I'm considering a kit lens for a walk around. Prefer the range over 14-42. to 42. Yeah, it works fine. No worries. I think it works perfectly fine with any micro photos camera. I have not heard of any lenses or micro photos that have any issues on any cameras. The only issues I've heard is that if you use Olympus lenses on Panasonic cameras, you don't enjoy the DFD technology, which is old. Or if you use Panasonic lenses on Olympus bodies, then you don't enjoy like the pro capture mode or the focus stacking or some of the advanced features, right? And if you use Olympus uh, Panasonic lenses on Olympus cameras, the aperture ring doesn't work. And if you use Olympus lenses or Panasonic lenses, vice versa on either bodies, then you don't get the full sync stabilization or the dual IS doesn't work. And that's it. Other than that, like in terms of picture quality, autofocus, everything works 100% fine. Hmm. Mika says, the best all around lens I found was the 14 to 150, took some great photos with it, upgraded to 12 to 100 F4 Pro. Yeah, I, I understand the appeal of getting an all around, all around lens if you need convenience if, or maybe you are in a position where you can't change lens, right? Uh, let's say you're shooting in the desert and you're stuck in a place where it's very dusty or it's, it's raining, right? You can't change lens. Then having a lens with such a massive zoom would be great. But having said that, these kind of lenses will always have compromises because they have such a massive zoom range. So, so the lens cannot be small. Like you cannot have this size. You gotta admit, there's something charming about carrying something this tiny versus a larger lens, right? And having that 14 to 150, uh, such a massive zoom range, there might be some compromises there and here in terms of image quality versus having a dedicated uh, standard zoom and a telephoto lens. Mika says, I also got the 14 to 42 and 14 to 150 in the kit with the EPM2. I think it's amazing. These are amazing lenses. 
Paul says, Hi Robin, I got a bit carried away and go to the EM5 Mark III and have the 2245, 9018, 50 macro and a 75 to 300 lenses. It's a challenge to work out and decide which one to use. I think these are all different lenses and they don't overlap. Like for example, if you just want a standard zoom, the 2245 is sufficient. If you want to do macro photography, then the 60 macro is the way to go. Then if you want to do birding or wildlife, then the 75 300 is the lens. So I don't see any overlap, right? If you want to do some uh, wide angle or landscape then a 9 to 18 is, is the choice right so yes these are there are a lot of lenses that you have and they're all relatively very small you can fit them in a camera bag and carry most of them with you you can leave one or two lenses that you know that you, you're not going to use let's say you're going to do macro of course you're not going to bring the 75 to 300 it doesn't make sense or if you're going to do portraits then it doesn't make sense to bring the macro lens right so yeah Chua says I was talking to Sil uh, it was not some problems with 15 f8. It was a lot of problems on optical quality. Yeah, it's, it's a cheap lens, of course. Nicholas says, I tried the 12 to 45 f4, but I don't travel a lot, and the 12 to 40 f2.8 seems to be a better fit for indoor with the 25 f1.8. Yeah, brighter aperture is always advantageous. You get a real light, and the real light will definitely improve image quality, no matter what you do. Was that a good choice on my end if it's not the best fit for the EM5 Mark III? No. I think 12 to 40 is an excellent lens regardless of whatever camera that you use it on. And if you already have the 12 to 40, I always tell people uh, it doesn't make sense to get a 12 to 45. K says, I also use my 9 lens cap on the EM1X and a 9 G9 Mark II. You don't need high end premium stuff to have fun. That's true. You can use whatever you want on whatever camera bodies, right? I also get the more expensive stuff too. Just enjoy your hobby. Yeah, that's what a lot of people forget, right? Like the point of doing photography as a hobby is to have fun. And once you stop having fun, then you lose sight or you have lost the purpose of photography in the first place. Rob is talking to Nicholas. It will be fine. I use the A to 25, both on the EM10 and OM5. I love fat lenses on small bodies. <laughs> That's one way to put it. Rick says, another difference between Lumix and Olympus is the rotation direction of the zoom ring. That is true. And I think to me that that's the thing that bothers me the most, uh, Rick. And like if I were to use Olympus and Panasonic lenses, zoom lenses, and let's say I'm used to Olympus one direction, right? And then Panasonic has the other direction. It just, it can cause me to lose shots, right? Because when you are changing lenses and you're shooting in, in, in a hurry, you turn the lens in the wrong direction and in, you just, yeah, you have a chance of, of losing shots. That's a risk, very dangerous risk. Ming says, is it difficult to remember how to use the camera function if owning too many camera? My muscle memory can only remember two cameras. Not true. I think cameras are like cars. It's like driving cars. There are some basics or fundamentals that will stay the same across all cameras. So if you get your fundamentals right and if you can master the basics, the exposure settings, for example, the aperture, shutter speed, and ISO, it's the same for all cameras. They all work the same way. There are some differences there and here that you need to understand like certain cameras has different autofocus behavior certain cameras will meter certain things differently but this doesn't make a huge difference you just have to operate on the basic level and you should be able to get consistent results whichever cameras that you use that's why i always tell people don't skip the basics like once you understand the basics you can use whatever camera you're able to get good results Nicholas Jen says, thanks Rob, it's a lot of money, to, so buyer's remorse kicked in. And thank you for confirming. Nah, don't worry. Uh, well, if you feel that if you have spent a lot of money on gear, well, there's only one way to make it worth spending. Take more photographs. Go out and freaking use it and shoot and shoot and shoot. And once you look at the photographs, you'll say, wow, that's really worth spending my money on, right? So yeah, go out and shoot more. Gregor says, since I bought 17 f1.2, I almost never used the 12 to 40 for indoors. Yeah, of course, like if you have a brighter aperture f1.2, then it makes sense to use that, right? You can collect a lot more light compared to f2.8. Like instead of using ISO, say, 3200, you can get away with ISO 400 or 800, right? With the f1.2 lens. And that's why we want the f1.2 bright aperture. But having said that, that lens is also not cheap and not a lot of people can afford f1.2 lenses, right? So that's why uh, people are staying with f2.8. But, but th then again, 
I would suggest that if you do a lot of low light photography, if you shoot a lot in low light, which I do, at least get the f1.8 lenses. They are not expensive, right? 45 f1.8, 17 f1.8. Uh, these lenses in the used market, they are not expensive and they make a huge difference if you compare with f2.8 lenses and you can get away with lower ISO, cleaner results, and definitely much better image quality. 3D Print Creator says, yeah, you said the magic word. My reason to stick with Olympus is the size. I have the pro cameras and the three extra lenses that I carry in a hip bag. It makes my work possible. Yeah, I know, right? I move a lot for my work. Like, I really need to move. And I really treasure the smaller size and the lighter weight of these cameras. Like, I don't have to break my back. And I can move around so much. I'm more agile, in a sense. And the more I move, the better my shots are. Nail says, hi Robin, hey Nail, nice to see you here, thanks for dropping by. I've been using the EM1 Mark II for like a long time with the F1.2 Pro lenses, 12-40 and even 35-100, the four-thirds version. If I ever want a significant image quality increase, fast autofocus will OM1 or move to A7 Mark IV. Of course, the A7 Mark IV will, will give you a huge jump because that's like what, a 61 megapixels camera, that's three times the pixel count of the OM1 and it's a full-frame camera so you get like better dynamic range and high ISO performance. That's no denying, right? Uh, in terms of autofocus, I've openly said that I don't like the OM1's autofocus. In fact, I prefer the EM1 Mark II. That's why I continue to use the EM1 Mark II for my jobs because I can't afford losing moments when I'm shooting for my clients. But having said that, uh, I said that the Sony gives you better image quality. That is true, but I also admit that my Micro Four Thirds setup, my Olympus EM1 Mark II and the OM1, the image quality that I get out of it, the 20 megapixels images, they are more than sufficient. I've hit a point of sufficiency where my clients are happy with the photographs, I'm happy with the photographs, and I post the photographs on my YouTube channel, on my social media, uh, I deliver them to my clients, everyone is happy, no one complained that they are not good enough. So if the images are good enough for what I need, then there's no point for me to upgrade, although I admit that the Sony has better image quality. I'm not denying that. You ca just can't fight physics. And if you want even better image quality, then go for medium format. Uh, Hasselblad X100 uh, Mark II, right? That is the 100 megapixels medium format. They'll give you even better pixel quality and better resolution, like almost double what the Sony can do. And medium format quality is definitely on a different level in terms of dynamic range, tonality, and per pixel, like, quality, right? It's like different level altogether. But do I need to get there? Like... Do my clients appreciate the 100 megapixel files when I'm just shooting like portraits for the website or like covering an, a, a live performance, you know? Like, yeah, sufficiency is very important. Like for now, I don't see the need for me to upgrade. Ronnie says, hi Robin, I have the 12-40 f2.8. It was the kit lens with the EM1. Yeah, it's, it's true, but I wouldn't call it a kit lens that we are discussing today because that is also very expensive on its own. Recently, I bought a Pan F and it's a bit too heavy. Would like to change the 1245 F4, yet the 1240 is such a great lens. If you are shooting with a Pan F, just get something like the Panasonic 12 to 32. I think it fits the Pan F so much better. It's slim. I think in terms of design, because the Pan F, if you're picking up Pan F, you want the beautiful design, right? The stylish, retro, vintage look. I think the 12 to 32 will be a better fit. Yeah. Norm says, will you be doing a chat to cover how to use various features of autofocus? I only use single autofocus for my photography, single autofocus. I've talked about it many, many, many times. So no point for it for me to do it in live it's just a single autofocus single did it click right and for my video i just set it to all focusing points continuous autofocus face detection and the camera will find my face that's it like simple right uh i don't think there are tricks or tips for autofocus i did share autofocus tips before these are single autofocus tips uh you can find it on my channel other than that i don't think it's worth exploring more as RV says, how did you got into photography? Good question, SRV. I did not know about photography until quite late, until my university days. And we're talking about the year 20, 
2004, 2005. So when I was in university studying uh, engineering in Uni University of Western Australia in Perth at that time, I realized that I was in a foreign land. I'm making a lot of new memories. I'm meeting new people. I was visiting new places. I was eating new food. And I saw dolphin for the first time in my life. And I was beating myself because I didn't have a camera to document these moments. So I worked my ass off and I managed to get my first camera, which was a Kodak point and shoot. And then, uh, yeah, the reason why I got the camera or got into photography was because I wanted to record memories so that I can share with my family and friends. And that's why I started my blog as well to talk about uh, the journey that I was in Australia, uh, things that I saw, what happened, people that I hang out with, the food that I ate. I was in a blog journal diary format uh, with, with a lot of photographs supporting my stories, right, that I share with people. Uh, that's the start of photography. And because I was an engineer, so I was very obsessed with the technical aspects of photography. And I uh, started to, to tinker with the aperture, shutter speed, and ISO. And then the first camera wasn't good enough. Then I bought a better camera, which I have some manual controls. That's why I learned about my camera basics from that Kodak point and shoot cameras in my first three years. I used that camera for three to four years until it died. And then I, I came back to Malaysia. I've graduated as an engineer. I came back and worked in Kuala Lumpur. And then uh, that's how I bought my first uh, DSLR, which was an Olympus E420. Uh, then it got stolen after three months. Very tragic story. Yeah, my first camera was stolen from me. Uh, then I bought the E520, so I actually treated the Olympus E520 as my first uh, DSLR, if, if that makes sense. And then from there, everything just started to snowball, and then I started to shoot every week, and then I started to blog about my journey on Olympus. I learned more and more. I did more photo shoots, and I started to do a bit of jobs. I became a weekend warrior. I did some wedding photography for my ex-colleagues. Uh, then, uh, yeah, then I got involved with Olympus, and that's you know the history already, right? Yeah, it all started with me just wanting to create memories and share uh, my moments with family and friends. Seal says uh, about f1.8 versus f1.2, with f1.8 you could wish you had f1.2 about 3% of the time, but if you beat the bullet f1.2, you would force yourself to find occasions to shoot full bore to justify it. Yeah, the f1.2 lenses are, I think, they're excellent. Uh, all the f1.2 lenses from Olympus and Panasonic, you know, the 17, 25, 45, and Panasonic's 42.5. All these f1.2 are excellent lenses. They are super sharp. They give like really nice shallow depth of field. The bokeh is beautiful. They're feathered bokeh. Uh, it's just that the price is a bit steep, and I'm not saying that it's not worth it, but I'm just also saying that it's not affordable for most people, right? But if you can afford it, you will not regret buying those lenses. 3D print creator says, again, size, my work wouldn't be possible with bigger gear, no Sony for me, as I would one would then have to wear a backpack instead of a hip bag for the same gear. Yeah, I also travel with a messenger shoulder bag instead of a large backpack, right? Chuck says, I found the 1245 F4 fits well on the Olympus EP7. Ah, good for you. Yeah, I just feel that. Yeah, with EP7, I'll probably use lenses like 17 f1.7 or 12 f2 or 25 f1.8 instead of like, you know, a, a large zoom lens. Or if I want a zoom lens, I'll probably pair it with this uh, Panasonic 12-32. Uh, I know it's not the same grade because the Olympus is a pro lens. It is weather sealed. Uh, it's sharper. But this Panasonic 12-32 is f3.5 to 5.6. You know, it's not too far from f4. It's also not a bad lens. It's, uh, the zoom range is also quite good. X Mida says, my first three lenses were Sigma 1770, uh, 55 300, and 50 f1.4. Those cover everything. White teleportrait, low light, learning how to work with depth of field. Very good selection of lenses, X Mida. Ron says, are there new OM lenses coming out soon? I hope so. There were the rumors of the, what, 55 to 200. And then there was another pattern that OM Digital Solutions made with the 12 to 100 f4 to 5.6 or something similar. Yeah, I hope those come. TMX says, hello, Robin. Please share with us the setting you use for filming your YouTube videos. Uh, my YouTube videos, actually the settings are very simple, right? I shoot in manual. I fix the aperture to, to the widest. If I'm using 45 f1.8, it's f1.8. 
I used one of the 50th of a second shutter speed and ISO 200. Uh, white balance auto and flat profile. Are those the settings you're asking for? Yeah, okay, I, I can repeat, right? Uh, one of the 50th of a second shutter speed, ISO 200, widest aperture f1.8. White balance auto, <laughs> auto focus, obviously, because I'm a one man crew, I just set up the camera and just shoot me, right? Uh, I shoot with a picture profile, flat profile, so that I can have better color grading. And yeah, that's it. What other settings are you looking for? Rob says, uh, KL is more photogenic than my city in Perth. I love my holidays in Malaysia. But Rob, I love Perth. Hey, the sky in Perth is like always impossibly blue. And every time here in Malaysia I go out, it's cloudy. I'll, I'll curse myself like, why am I not in Perth? And the, the city of Perth is so vibrant. They have so many beautiful arts. Like the graffiti is so colorful and so bombastic. And like the, the city itself, I know it's a different vibe from Malaysia. You get totally different photographs it's not fair to compare but in Perth they have this steel glass a lot of reflections a lot of this modern geometry architectural lines texture it just looks so good like I would spend days and days in Perth just to walk around like the the streets downtown in the city uh the CBD area like Hay Street Marie Street uh North Bridge area was it North Bridge yeah I'm confused with, with the names. And what was that? Uh, oh man, uh, what was that? Alice, was it Elizabeth Key? If I remember correctly, the name? I, I don't remember all the names really. Along the Swan River, and all these structures, man, they are so beautiful. Like, I just do street photography all day long. And people there are friendly as well. Like, people say, ah, oh, you know, Malaysians are friendly. You can just take portraits of people here, right? But I walk up to strangers in Perth and ask for permission to take portraits, and they say, yes. <laughs> man, I would love to do street photography in Perth, and oh, I should look up for tickets. Hey, yeah, I should, I should go back to Perth one of these days. Edgar says, currently I'm using the Olympus 14 to 42 kit lens for street photography, eyeing for Panasonic 12 to 32. Yeah, you should definitely get one if you can find one in a used market. Like here in Malaysia, you can find one for like I saw some in the, in Carozelna selling for like 350 ringgit. That's less. That's about 80 US dollars. That's cheap. Like it's a guilt free purchase. Norm says, I love my Kodak Easy Share 5 megapixel camera. First digital camera that I own that had noticeably shutter lag. Yeah, I know, right? The shutter lag was phenomenal. Mine was a 4 megapixels Kodak CX7430. Amazing camera. I still love it. Chua says, Hi Robin, just wondering which kit lens you think was the best for image quality in Micro Four Thirds? Uh, I would definitely suggest between these two, whether it's the Lumix 12 to 32 kit lens, which is excellent, super, super sharp. And I also like this Olympus 14 to 42 pancake kit lens. Both give sharp results. Some people claim that the Panasonic 12 to 32 is sharper. I personally think that this 14 to 42 is sharper. I've compared this 14 to 42 versus the Panasonic. Uh, I find that the Olympus is slightly sharper, but to be entirely honest, they are negligible. They are both about the same in terms of sharpness and image quality. Uh, but yeah, some who don't like the uh, slowness of the electronic zoom in terms of this uh, 14 to 42, I understand that you prefer the mechanical zoom on the 12 to 32. And yeah, then either one, you, you can't go wrong. Both are excellent lenses. I've actually made a video to talk about both lenses. You can check it out, Olympus uh, 12 to 32. John Lowe, hey! <laughs> How are you, John? Okay, la, today I won't promote you. La, huh? <laughs> John is a fellow uh, photographer in Kuala Lumpur. He's an amazing, I would think that he's one of the best wedding photographers. I will always pull out his YouTube channel and promote him. Today I won't do so. <laughs> How is that? Well, you guys can search John Low on YouTube. Like, he, he does really amazing content. And John, please update your YouTube channel. Update, update, update. Like, please, we can just go out for a photo shoot. Like, if you need help, I don't mind holding a camera for you. Hey, like, seriously. SRV says, getting an Olympus EM10 for $150. Is this a good deal? Yeah, I think it's a great deal. Yeah. John says, Perth has blue fish. Not blue fish la, yo. What was that called again? The blue, the boat house. Damn, that, this, it's a boat shed. There's, there's a name. There's, there's a name. Let me just search. 
Puff, Perth. I, I just can't. My brain, like you guys know, right? If I'm doing live stream, I need to think about the microphone, the audio, I have to monitor my camera resources, the computer resources to look at OBS and everything. Like my brain just doesn't work. Puff, bot shed. Let's see what it says. Crowley Edge bot shed. <laughs> John, they're not blue fish house la, yo, it sounds so bad. Yes, King's Park is amazing. Like I used to, like, I'm going to tell this story, right? When I got my first camera, I immediately bought a tripod. And I remember I had to hand in an assignment to university on the same day. So my uni was in University of Western Australia, just next to King's Park. After I've handed in an assignment, I walk all the way up to the King's Park during sunset, all the way up, uh, I think it's about a 45 minutes hike, very slow hike. And when I reached the top, it was dark. I set out the tripod. I took the long exposure image of the city. Man, I was so happy I got the shot. That's when I knew that I wanted to do photography more seriously. Like th that feeling that night after I got that shot of the city, I don't have the shot now with me, um, but man, it was it was magical. Yeah, that's that's what photography does to you, right? If you can get that shot that you really like, that positive feeling, it just stays with you. Right. Ron says, when you go to Ipoh, give greetings to my son. Dutch, he is on holiday over there with his fiance from the Yo family. I will come over end of this year for their marriage and hope to meet you there. Yeah, I'm quite far from Ipoh. Hey, I'm in Kuala Lumpur. So I did go to Ipoh from time to time, usually just passing by on the way to Penang or maybe just someone's getting married there. For This is why I'm visiting it. Um, but usually we don't just visit Ipoh for no reason. Hey, but yeah, if you are in KL, yeah, maybe we can meet for a coffee. That'll be great. 3D print creator says, Rob S and Robin, photography in a foreign country is always more nice than in your own place. Yeah, I know, right? People come to Amsterdam for photography while I escape the country and find other spots. But that's not true for me. Like, I enjoy doing photography here in my backyard in Kuala Lumpur or my hometown in Kuching. I always find something interesting to photograph. I always say that you, because you, you grow up in your location and you know your location well, knowing your location is key to getting good shots because you may enjoy shooting elsewhere like a foreign land better because everything is new everything is fresh you've never seen it before everything is exciting right but because it's new to you you may not know it well enough to get the best shots or the best photographs it takes some time for you to know the location then you can truly make magic happen yeah hmm. Auto correct. <laughs> no worries. Nicholas says, uh, thoughts on this quiet 2023 on the micro four thirds outside of G9 Mark II, DP review rated micro four thirds C minus in 2023 review. The volume and lens selection is so wide already. Maybe innovation is not as important. I disagree. I think there's still plenty of room for, for innovation. In fact, I think micro four thirds is lagging behind. And if we talk about this, like micro four thirds future, is micro four thirds dead? Is it still relevant? I've talked about this in some, some of my past streams. I'm not going to re repeat all of them here, but both Panasonic and on digital solutions, they need to buckle up. They really need to sit together and really need to get serious about moving forward if they want to stay alive in Micro Four Thirds because Micro Four Thirds share is dropping in the market. It's like on digital solutions, it's not even in the top five. It's not even listed. Like it's less than 5% in the market. That's how meager the number is. Like if they don't take this seriously, they will just disappear. Like previously, Olympus was number one in Japan and they were doing really well at top three, at least number three, number four in the world, right? Now they're not even in the top five and you know, it's like they are disappearing, right? And part of this is because they don't have enough new products. They understand that Onigiri Solutions took over Olympus, takes some time, but it's been what, four years now? And they only have like a few products and all the products, we don't really get the wow factor, whereas everyone is improving, like Sony, Fuji, you know, Canon, Nikon, they're driving innovations. Look at what Nikon is doing with the ZF. Look at what Sony is doing with a lot of the new cameras, right? Look at what Canon is doing. Everyone is pushing forward better sensor technology. Like Sony is coming with global shutter. Everyone has innovation, but Micro Four Thirds seems to be staying stagnant and seems to be playing catch up. So I think they really need to find ways to go back to their glorious days like back in the day, Micro Four Thirds was the, was the pioneer for mirrorless technology. They were the forefront. They were the ones telling people, hey, this is what mirrorless should be. This is how you make mirrorless cameras. They were the leader of mirrorless and look at what they're doing now. They are like 
trailing behind everyone else. So yeah, uh, they are doing very poorly. I think C- is being very generous, if you ask me. I personally would have given them a D. John says, yep, both house, correct. Duryo says, the kit lens on the micro filters is surprisingly sharp and small. Not a fan of power zoom version though. Yeah. I think a lot of people also don't like the, the electronic zoom. I agree, but it's for video, right? So if you're not doing video work, then electronic zoom has no purpose for you. Rob says, yeah, maybe I need to look at things differently. Yeah, it's all about how we look at things, right? And it's also about us appreciating things around us, like trying to see things for what they are, like finding beauty in ordinary things. There are a lot of beauty around us. We don't have to go far to look for them, right? And that's how we can photograph. Because photography, at the end of the day, is how it's a photographer's vision. So if we can find a way to, to see things differently and find a beauty in the things that we see, then it will change our photography outcome as well. Nell says, when we go night snap with a f1.2 lens and a four second shutter speed, my full frame APS-C friends just can't believe it. I know, right? And just have to stay at ISO 200. <laughs> Whereas they have to go at ISO 6400 or 2800, right? Dimitrio 3D says, why do you think Olympus never made the Panef successor? I think it sold quite well and the new version would have been a success. We talk about this in a stream where I talk about what we want in a Panef Mark II. And you are not correct when you said that Panef sold well. Panef did not sell well. In fact, it was a failure. So because it didn't sell as well in terms of business, it didn't do well. For strategic reasons, it doesn't make sense to come up with a successor for a product that did not do well or didn't hit the sales target. If the Panef has sold really well, if it was selling out everywhere, then obviously there'll be a Panef Mark II. Obviously Olympus want to make more money, right? It doesn't make sense they'll come up with a successor. It did not sell well. And one of the reasons or many reasons why it didn't sell well is because it, did, it was not weather sealed. It was too expensive. It has poor electronic viewfinder. The autofocus is subpar. If you compare with EM5 Mark II at that same time, EM5 Mark II has a, a robust body with better uh, video features. It has weather sealing. It has better viewfinder. So yeah, it doesn't make sense to get a pen F. John says, update already, 10 minutes video. Apparently it was boring. Not much of traction that video. Ah, no la. This, I don't think there is no, uh, there's any boring video, John. It's just that I think your video is about the Langkawi wedding, right? And that is a more specific video to target on potential clients. Yeah. So we need like a video to have, uh, to reach out for a general audience who, who, who want to look at, hey, like John's uh, vlogging or like your drone. You, I think your drone would have a, a, a far wider reach for ordinary audience, right? Or we can just do like a photo walk, uh, like Sakin Chan walks, they will reach a, a far wider audience. Rob says, John, we have the best sand dunes. <laughs> yeah, we do. Yeah, Perth, yes, sand dunes in Perth. That's really something. Squared Out says, I had an employee evaluation today, so I had to miss all of the stream. Oh, I need to know if the Lumix 232 is the best kit lens. 232 is one of the best kit lenses. I can't say it's the best because I think, uh, oops, sorry, I shouldn't be touching the microphone. It will cause some handling noise between like uh, the 12 to 32, this. Oh, sorry, this is the 14 to 42 Olympus and the 12 to 32. I personally prefer the Olympus version because I think it's a little bit sharper, but I also have come to enjoy using this Panasonic uh, 12 to 32 because it has image stabilization and this Lumix GM1 doesn't have image stabilization. So using this lens makes more sense on a Panasonic body. So yeah, there you go. Hmm. Rob has said, Romy must have an A-grade lens to get into uni or Western Australia. Ah. Oh. That's not true, hey. <laughs> like people think that people who go to UWA is smart, yeah. But but I did struggle a lot studying there. It's not easy, but uh, yeah. But but then again, uh, I was very thankful to be able to to study there. Uh, it was an eye opening experience. It taught me a lot. Uh, in terms of developing myself as an engineer and seeing things from a different way, especially in problem solving. And I also believe that a lot of the things that I've learned from my university days in the UWA has translated into my career as a photographer. 
and even before that, as a product specialist in Olympus, uh, my engineering training has helped me a lot because I was seeing things differently. I was seeing things from a practical point of view. And that's why my employers, they, they treasure that. And it helped me a lot in my career as well. And as a photographer or as a content creator, as a blogger, as a YouTuber, being an engineer, I have to have structure. I have to see things in a logical way. And that helped me to cut out a lot of... Um, for the lack of a better word, bullshit, you know, you get what I mean? You get a lot of bullshit in YouTube, uh, on social media, online, everywhere now. You watch videos, people and say a lot of this crap. Uh, for me, no. Like if I were to say something, I need evidence to back it up. How do I find evidence? If I come up with a problem, how do I solve the problem? All this, I go back to my engineering days, like all this training for me to graduate from UWA, I think it helps me a lot now as a content creator. And it adds a lot to my credibility as well. Like when I do things um, with integrity, when I do things with evidence, right? When people see me, how I talk to them and how I present my evidence to back up my claims, they'll say, oh, this guy actually knows what he's talking about. He's not just pulling things out of thin air. Chua says, Hi Robin, just curious, what would you think if you compare Olympus Lumix with other brands with microphotos kit lens like Kodak and Xiaoyi? I've never used the Kodak and Xiaoyi kit lens before, so I can't say if they're any good or bad. It's only unfair if I just, again, pull things out of thin air, right? Like, make comments out of nothing. I can't. Unless I have the Kodak and Xiaoyi, then I, I have to refrain from saying anything about this. Nam says, good evening, Robin. Hey, how are you? Thanks for dropping by. I recently bought an old EPL5, but without a lens. I'm aiming for a 12 to 50 macro kit. In your opinion, is it okay? Thanks. Yeah, why not? I think 12 to 50 is an excellent lens. I have it here. It's weather sealed. Uh, it has a long range, 12 to 50. It has an excellent macro function. Don't forget about the macro function. Uh, with the macro function, you can get really close. I think it's about half the magnification, uh, real life magnification, which can give you really... Uh, impressive results close up results they will open up a lot of different shooting opportunities for you yeah go for it if you can find one why not mm. srv says hope you have a great year robin and keep up the positive attitude no worries thank you for being here srv i really appreciate that 3d print creator says looking at things differently i bought the domain laren Krijen, uh learn to look instead of uh, learn photographer and learn photography because looking is essential for, for photography. Yes, as a photographer, we have to observe, we have to see things, and it's through our seeing that we can translate to the pictures that we capture, right? So seeing is more important than everything else. A lot of people forget this or they didn't realize this. This is like a very important thing about how to be a better photographer, just improve the way you see life. Terry says, this is interesting from Four Thirds Rumors, BCN ranking for 2023. Three OM digital cameras made it to the top 10 of the best selling cameras of the year. Six was EP7, eight was EPL10, and nine was EM10 Mark IV. That is true. Yeah, but in terms of uh, market share, there's still less than 5%. Also from BCN, right? This is the same place where they come up with all these rankings. And this is based on the numbers of cameras being shipped. And it's no surprise that uh, these cameras, they are not the most expensive cameras. It's always the entry-level cameras. They made it to the top 10. In fact, so this is like 6, 8, and 9, right? If you remember correctly, there was once, just like two or three years ago, EM10 was at number one. I think EM10 Mark three. I can't remember which EM10 version was at number one. Olympus was number one at BCN ranking. And now they have dropped to like six, eight, and ninth. It shows how bad things are. Seal says about the Penev is far too expensive for what it is. I agree. I agree. Rob S says, fun fact, Robin, I was in a camera shop last week and bought some gear. I joked to the sales guy that I must be keeping OM system in business. He said most sales have been to young people. <laughs> yeah, I I don't know. Hey, all those birders and wildlife photographers, I don't think they are young. To be able to afford like the 300 F4 Pro and 150 F to 400 Pro, how do young people afford these lenses? 
Nail C says, my idea for microphotos future is AI photography. For a better term, computational photography. Microphotos picture size is smaller than full frame. Should do something like that of you enhance the noise AF. Yeah, I think we can't es escape from AI. AI will be integrated with everything. It's already integrated with photography in cameras these days. Uh, it's already integrated in a JPEG processing. It's integrated with autofocus. It's the subject detection and everything, right? The bird detection and uh, all the smart uh, autofocus continuous tracking. And AI will be more and more integrated in how the camera functions and operates from here onwards. Crystal says, hey Robin, enjoying the stream. Thank you so much. Thanks for being here. Wonder what happened when OM Digital Solutions decided to just rebatch the EM5 Mark III with literally the same body that still breaks the tripod mount like the older one. I have no idea what they are doing there. I slammed them for that in my video. I was take, talking about how the OM5 was actually underwhelming. So yeah, I really don't know what they were doing. I think the, the bigger sin was the micro USB, right? Like seriously, in the year 2022, 2023, we still have a micro USB in the camera. Like what the hell were they thinking? Skoda says, where did you get the hat, Robin? Ha, huh, this is a secret. I will not tell for now. I will keep. <laughs> All right, time check. It is eight minutes past midnight. We have been live for more than two hours. I'm gonna drink more water just to keep myself hydrated. Ah, there's still more than 100 people here. That's amazing. Hmm. And if you have enjoyed this stream, please, please, please send me some love. You can support me by sending super chat or you can buy me a cup of coffee. There's a link up here. Buy me coffee or in the description below. Or you can send me contribution directly through PayPal. Any small contribution is definitely, definitely appreciated. They will keep me going. Like a lot of these things that I do here, uh, will require money, right? Like I've just used a new capture card. If you don't realize, this is actually in 4K. I'm streaming in 4K. Huh. We have a super chat and it's from Entrick. Thank you so much, Entrick. Entrick is sending super chat in every single stream. Man, you are amazing. And you know, like the, the latest uh, capture card that, that streams 4K, it costs like 50, 60 US dollars. Yeah, I use my own money for that. And when you guys send me money through the, the super chat, or buy me coffee or uh, PayPal, it goes directly to the funds on helping me to improve what I do here, like making better quality streams. Right now you can see photos in 4K. After this, I'm gonna share a set of photographs before we call off the night. They'll be in 4K as well. You can see everything in greater clarity, right? You'll help me to be a better content creator. And yeah, that's all thanks to you. Thanks to you and Trick and all the others uh, before that have already sent me some contributions. I'm just gonna drink a bit more water. Hmm. Hmm. All right. And drink a bit more coffee. Okay. And I have this second set of photographs that I'm going to share. Also taken with this Lumix GM1 and a 12-32. Uh, this was a trip back to my hometown Kuching recently with a group of friends. We just want to spontaneously make a few days trip just to enjoy some food, visit some places. It's a relaxing trip. Uh, we did enjoy it immensely. Kuching is my hometown in Borneo. And I only carried, I decided to carry this uh, GM1, which is the world's smallest interchangeable lens camera. I know a lot of people say, uh, but, but Pentax Q is smaller. Like seriously, if you go and compare the dimensions, uh, the height, width, and depth, this Lumix GM1 is smaller. Like seriously smaller. I pair with this tiny uh, 12 to 32 because this has image stabilization on the lens. The body doesn't have it, so I can benefit it from the lens. And this was the only travel kit that I have uh, for that particular trip. And I'm going to share like maybe around... 15 photographs from that trip. So a lot of food photographs. So here we go. This was the uh, a shop at Kaiju Lane. Kaiju Lane, uh, serving some traditional food uh, that we visited. Uh, we get a lot of these old shops, which has a lot of character. They are so photogenic. All right, and this is Kolomi. Man, I can't wait to have another Kolomi. I'm flying home soon for Chinese New Year. And Kolomi is like the signature noodle dish in Sarawak or Kuching, you can find it. And strangely, you can't find any good Kolomi here in other parts of Malaysia. You just have to go to Sarawak and especially Kuching to find good Kolomi. It's uh, yellow noodles with uh, some uh, condiments on it, but it tastes so good. 
And yeah, these are my friends, Jason and Gunn. I'm meeting them again this coming Sunday. We're going to catch up. Uh, Jason has contributed to a super chat earlier. Thank you so much, Jason. We were having coffee at Bean Coffee. And you guys don't know this particular coffee place. Bean Coffee was where I used to hang out when during my younger days. We don't have a lot of hangout places in Kuching. We don't have a lot of coffee places. This was one of the few places that we hang out. So I brought my friends to, to revisit some of my nostalgic places in Kuching. Another color me, I had a lot, a lot of color me's. This is a different version. This is the red version with the red sweet sauce. Uh, this is so nice. This is actually from one of my favorite places. This is really it's an Oriental Park uh, in the city. It's really, really, really nice. And this is my friend Spencer. We have um, this very nice background <laughs> split into two. I thought it would be fun to have our photographs taken with a split in the middle. And that's. Uh, that's why it says Kaiju Lane. <laughs> no joke. Uh, this is the, the shop at the Kaiju Lane that serves. This is what they call bulletproof coffee. It's just uh, black coffee with a dash of butter. Yeah. And it's nice. It's very, very nice. And this is something, it's a love it or hate it affair. I love it, of course, because it's a local dish in Sarawak. It's called Blachan Bihun. It's, uh, it tastes, it, it smells very pungent, but it tastes really nice. It has century egg, it has uh, squid, it has uh, verm vermicelli, rice vermicelli with uh, all the other condiments like chili, as well as uh, bean sprouts and uh, what you call that, shredded cucumber, everything in this nice broth, which is really, really, really nice in blachan broth. I love this, but a lot of people don't like the pungent smell. And this is mini burger, or this is what we call kompia. It's basically pork in deep fried buns, mini buns. It's really, really nice. And this is tomato fried kwetiao, or rice noodles. It's rice flat noodles in tomato sauce. And this is one of my favorite thing to eat growing up. I at least I ate this like at least once a week growing up. This is like my favorite local dish. You can't find this elsewhere. You can find it in Kuala Lumpur, I guess, but it's not the same. And this is Ngo Hyang. In Kuching, we call it Ngo Hyang, but in Penang, they call it Lo Ba. Basically, it's just uh, spring rolls with uh, minced pork, deep fried. And we visited the Daruhana Bridge at the waterfront at night. I love reflections. So yeah, this was shot with, the, everything is shot with the 12 to 32 lens, right? Nice reflection action happening. And this was the view from the bridge uh, facing the sunset. The colors are not edited, yeah? It was this magenta pinkish color. It was as is, it was as I remembered. I didn't tweak the color to make it look better. And yeah, this the new floating mosque. Uh, by the waterfront. I think this is near the main bazaar area. Right. And this is the bridge looking at night with the floating mosque. This is the Daruhana Bridge coming out or coming down. Depends on how you see it. Right. Another view of the bridge, of course. Uh, this was shot at like ISO 3200 or 6400. I can't remember. It was very high. If I zoom in, there'll be a lot of noise. But who cares? Just take the photograph. Sometimes people are too obsessed with noise. All you have to do is just grab the moment, grab the shot. Image should still look good. It's the moment. It's the memory that matters, right? And this is Sarah Laksa. Uh, Anthony Bourdain. Res Rest in peace, Anthony Bourdain, when he was alive, he came to Sarawak and he tried the Sarawak laksa and he claimed that the Sarawak laksa is the breakfast of gods. Like, no kidding. And uh, this is one of my favorite breakfasts. It is so good. It's prawn-based uh, or shrimp-based broth with rice vermicelli, shredded chicken, and shredded omelette, and of course, some prawns on top of it. This is a three-layer tea or Te si Peng special. It's... Uh, tea, black tea with evaporated milk and a layer of, uh, we call it gula apong. It's a local brown sugar in Sarawak, the three layer tea. It's so sweet, so dangerous, but it's so good. This is a Borneo Cultures Museum. We spent half a day there. If you are in Sarawak, you must visit Borneo Cultures Museum. It's an international great museum. They talk about a lot of the earlier life of the Dayaks in Sarawak. 
the it's more about people and culture, right? And it, they explore life and death, the traditions and everything. It's just, it's a must must visit if you come to Sarawak. And I um, I did take a lot of photographs in there, but I'm not gonna bore you with your details. You just have to go there and see it for yourself in person, all right? That's it. That's all I have to share. Everything taken with uh 12 to 32. All the shots were taken with this camera, GM1 and 12 to 32. I think this is the perfect uh, travel companion. Just take some food photographs, location shots, people shots. Uh, yeah, that's all I brought along. I did not bring a second lens for that particular trip. All right. Okay, uh, back to the comments. Hmm. Chrisu says, also enjoying my recent purchase of Olympus 14 to 150 Mark I for just above about $100 to replace my shattered Mark II version dropped. <laughs> oh my goodness. So sorry to hear that, man. That's painful. Shame to have to give it up on weather ceiling. Yeah. Well, depends. I wouldn't... If, if you do a lot of shooting in rain, you will know that you need a weather sealed lens, right? The fact that you went for the Mark I means that you probably do most of your photography in non-harsh uh, conditions. So I think that's fine. Yeah, yeah. Henry Turner breaking the OM5. Yep, I saw that as well. <laughs> Robert says, cute lady. I'll definitely tell my friend Gun that you said that. Chan Ke says, yummy. Hey Chan, how are you? Very nice to see you here. Javon says, which cap capture card are you using? I'm using the Easy Cap uh, capture card. I'm not even sure if I can find it. Uh, no, I can't find it online. The brand is Easy Cap and it's a 4K. Just search Easy Cap. Marco, hey, how are you? Very nice to see you here, Marco. Uh, Marco is saying hi to everyone. Uh, his tripod tip over. Yeah, it wasn't the fault of the camera. That's true. The tripod did fall. Rob S says, it's more to do with carrying the camera with front heavy lens by the tripod mount screw and a peak design clip. That also, that's another problem. Hey, Kalai, how are you? Kalai is a fellow photographer from Malaysia. He's an, an excellent wedding photographer himself. Hi, Kalai. Kalai says, Hi, Robin. Great to be with Micro Four Thirds Group, Lumix 12-35 or Olympus 12-40. Which one is a better choice? I always learn something from you in every video. Which camera are you using currently and what other lenses do you have? My issue with mixing Olympus and Panasonic lenses is that they, when you zoom, they turn on a different direction. So it's best like if you have Olympus zoom lenses, just stay with Olympus zoom lenses. If, if you use Panasonic zoom lenses, just stay with Panasonic zoom lenses so that every time you change lens, you just have to zoom in one direction. Imagine you're shooting a wedding, everything happens so fast, you change from let's say a 1235 to Olympus 40 to 150, and you have to quickly zoom and you zoom to the wrong direction, you miss the shot. That is so frustrating. I, I don't know why this Olympus and Panasonic, they don't just sit down and synchronize everything and standardize the zoom direction, rotation, whatever. Everything is at the opposite direction. It's just, it just doesn't make sense. Both are great lens, 12 to 35 or Olympus 1240. You can't go wrong. It's just that you have to ask yourself which lenses you plan to use. It's best to just stay with one rotating direction when you zoom so that you don't miss shots, right? Rob says, take care, everyone. Thanks for being here, Rob. Really nice to see you. Nicholas says, coffee and butter. Definitely giving that a shot soon. Thank you for the appetizing pictures. No worries. Just want to share that. Yeah, this uh, 12 to 32 is more than sufficient to get the job done. I actually shot some low light shots, some taken with very high ISO. So yeah, no worries. The Micro Four Thirds large sensor can still do the job and the kit lens is more than enough to get some fantastic shots. Like if you're traveling, you're not doing anything too serious, why not? It's still fully, fully, fully capable. All right, time check. It is 20 minutes past midnight here in Malaysia and I think I am going to put a stop to the stream. We have been live for almost two and a half hours already. <laughs> and there is still about 84 of you here. That's a lot of you. All right, uh, I hope you've enjoyed this stream. I've shared two sets of photographs, one an actual event coverage doing with this uh, GM1 with the four, uh, 12 to 32 kit lens. I showed that this is capable in delivering great shots, doing actual work. I also show that for some personal work, uh, for some travel and some everyday shots, casual shoots, the 12 to 32 kit lens is more than sufficient. And I think Micro Four Thirds make really capable, tiny, compact, really, really sharp kit lenses. And for that, I'm very, very appreciative of what Micro Four Thirds bring to photography. I appreciate the Micro Four Thirds kit lenses. I appreciate kit lenses a lot. I think newcomers to photography should start with kit lenses. Don't jump 
to higher grade lenses too soon, don't upgrade too fast, stay with kit lens, learn the basics first, and then you can maximize whatever lens you upgrade to later. If you have found my stream useful, please, please send me some super chat on the stream, or you can buy me some coffee. Yeah, the link is up here, or you can find the link in the description below. You can just click on the link, or you can use my PayPal, send me some contributions so that I can continue to improve this live stream, which I just did. This is in glorious 4K, and I'm glad that wow this 4k the entire stream has no hiccup finally everything went well i think it was quite smooth i hope it was smooth i i don't think you guys have any issues right yeah so all these uh new equipments new gadgets like this microphone this pop filter the uh, capture card the 4k capture card the hdmi cable all these small things, uh, AOD lights, and all these things, they cost money, right? And with your contributions from the Super Chat or Buy Me Coffee, it really, really helped me to make this live stream a little bit better for everyone to enjoy, right? And of course, it helped me to continue making videos on my main channel as well. All right, until the next one, uh, I hope you guys take care and please go out and take more photographs. Bye-bye.